Discord. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is brought to you by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people. Our guest today is Jeff Harry. Jeff, are you ready to be great today? Yeah, let's do this. I'm excited. Jeff combines positive psychology and play to help teams, organizations create psychologically safe workplaces and to assist individuals in addressing the, their biggest challenges through em embracing a play-oriented approach to work. Some of the topics he covers include how to deal with toxicity in the workplace, how to address office of politics, how to play with your inner critic, how to help your staff rediscover the flow, and how to navigate these uncertain times through play. For his work, Jeff was selected by Bamboo HR and engaged Lee as one of the top 100 HR influencers of 2020. His work has most recently been featured in the New York Times, Massable, Upworthy, Sonderland, and Wired. Jeff has worked with, worked with Google, Microsoft, Southwest Airlines, Adobe, the NFL, Amazon, and Facebook, helping their staff to infuse more play into the day-to-day. -day. Jeff, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much for having me. So, Jeff, um, my daughter actually works at, works at Southwest, so I kind of know the culture there. So I can definitely see how what you're doing, like, fitting, like, easily with the culture of Southwest, because, like, she doesn't always talk about the stuff they do there, you know, that's how it's a mm -hmm. fun place it is that work there. Yeah, it's it's actually one of the one of my first blog posts that I ever wrote was about Southwest and how um, they go by um, one of their tenants is servant leadership, you know, and this whole idea that you know it's all about how I'm how I'm how do I lead where I'm actually putting not just a, a customer first, right, but my staff first, because it like, you know, covers, it empowers and develops people. Um, when you're a servant leader, you express like humility, authenticity, interpersonal acceptance, stewardship. Um, and then the whole time you're like providing direction, but not in like a pompous or toxic way. Um, and I really respect what they do because like one of, one of my friends is a flight attendant there and she gets to do she does the intercom you know like like welcome passengers and she gets to do whatever she wants she can say whatever she wants like give her full freedom you know and then also like she gets to work when she wants you know or she has to pick up a certain amount of shifts but she can get more if she wants if she needs more money and things like that so it's surprisingly flexible and um you also can own a piece of the company which is really yes cool. Yeah, and my daughter says pretty much like there's no really no time schedule. You know, of course you got to be there in the office. And we're talking about pre-COVID, mm -hmm. of course. But like, you know, people were like, you know, like come and go as they please. They got to pick a dry clean. It's, it's more like you no know, performance, you know. Do you perform? Yep. Like it, it takes, we don't care when you come and go, but you know, of course it means you have to go to be able to perform. And one interesting story, I hope I get this correct. So uh, a year ago, the, the original CEO of the company, you know, passed away, you know. Yeah. He, he would always drink wild turkey. And I, and, and for a certain amount of time, I, I want to say it was 30 days, but maybe it was less than that. For 33 days, everyone there took a side of wild turkey, like around 9 or 10 in the morning, right? <laughs> As a tribute to, to, the, to the original founder, right? That's awesome. And of course, you know, wild turkey is not, not the best bourbon out there, right? No, so, no, it's horrible. <laughs> yeah. And my daughter's not really a big drinker. If it's not no bourbon, you know, if it's no wild turkey, you know, of course, you, know, you have to do it right to be a team player, right? And that's the type of things they do at, you know, Southwest, which is. I, I, oh, I love that because like that also like just shows it's like a form of attunement where we're all in this together. We're all doing this together. And I think the other part that I love about what you said about they get to come and go when they want is I feel like that's where like leadership and companies need to be going. If you still are forcing your staff to be there for eight hours a day, especially if they don't need to be there for eight hours a day and instead give them the freedom to get work done on their own time as long as they get their work done. I feel like that's the evolution and the future of work. But if we're not doing that, then I don't know what we're doing. Yeah, it's definitely a good place to work at, I, I think, you know, because like she's like, she, people have been like 20, 30 years, you know, since the company began, you know, and just like, this is a way to have, have, have it set up, you know. But that's the reason why Southwest used like one of the top two or three air, airlines in the, in, in the country, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. So Jeff, next, can you define... What, what do you mean by psychologically safe, safe workplace? So, you know, I always say how culture is defined by the worst behavior tolerated. 
right? So like, who's the most toxic person at your company that you, and, and you tolerate their, their, uh, their behavior? Because then that sets the tone for everyone else. And when you actually are in a psychologically safe work environment, uh, your staff are able to have difficult conversations with you. Your staff are able to disagree with you as a leader at work. Um, you're, you are able to have like open, transparent conversations about like finances, how the company's doing. And then, fr and then also you see a lot of psychological safety simply by the amount of laughter that you see at meetings, or even what you just said with the wild turkey thing, like the, the fact that people are comfortable enough to do things like that, right, shows that there's a certain level of trust that is built. And I think for a lot of companies, especially coming out of the pandemic, they've lost a lot of trust with their staff. You know, that, that's why 30.8 million people quit their jobs in 2021 as part of like this great resignation. And now there's like this whole anti-work movement because people do not trust their leaders. And the more that you can actually do stuff where your staff feel comfortable enough to show up as themselves just a little bit, the more you actually have a psychologically safe work environment. And then talk about the great resignation. Like when I retired from the military back in 2015, it'll kill me. Like you don't joke a job location, upload your resume. Next screen. Type in everything in your resume. Like, you kidding exactly. me, right? And now, I, I, like, people are still doing it, right? All these mm -hmm. companies talking about, we can't find work. Well, your, your canned experience sucks, right? It's horrible. Like, make it easy for people to apply. Like, I love the jobs out there where, you, like, you apply the job, one click on LinkedIn, and upload your resume. Yeah, exactly. Like, 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 like what kills me, too, like, the cover letter, right? People say, well, do a cover letter so you can tell them, come to your, your interest in applying. While fitting me clicking the application button, tell them I'm interested in applying. Like, you know, like I don't know. Right? Just, I don't get it. Well, it's the the it's not user friendly, right? And and again, they're not putting themselves in the shoes of the employee. And this is the first time in a long time, and it might be the first time you know since like the last pandemic, where the employee is in the driver's seat. You know, staff are in the driver's seat in many ways. So if companies are not going above and beyond or doing something as simple as like making it easy to apply, then I don't want to. Right. You know, and then the other thing, you know, regarding great the great resignation, there's a lot of companies now that are like, oh, yeah, well, a bunch of people are going to quit, but then they're just going to come back. You know, at some point they need the money. And it's just like, but not, to your, finding, but, but not to your company. People are not coming to your company, but also people are finding other ways to make money. There's right. So like you can money make right money now. on Twitch. You can make money doing task rabbit. You can figure out other ways. Like people are figuring it out. They're starting their own organizations. You know, they're, you know, they're cobbling up two or three or four different jobs rather than going back to your company. So if you don't address the underlying themes as to why people quit, like toxic leadership, uh, work that doesn't really matter, um, ridiculous hours, not enough pay horrible um, benefits or just average benefits, you know, if you're not thinking about that, then you're basically going to become irrelevant. You won't, you won't go out of business. You'll just become irrelevant, which means like you'll get mediocre staff and your, and your company will slowly dwindle into non-existence. Yeah. <laughs> somebody did a, somebody did a post on Twitter today and it said, um, the greatest recruiter cannot solve your turnover problem. And yeah. I thought that was so, so accurate. Right? Exactly. Exactly. That's that's perfect. Oh, I love that. I got to write that down. Your great, your wait. What did you say? That your greatest you, recruiter can I solve your turnover problem? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that because then it's just a revolving door. Yes. So another challenge too, I think, is with um with like job search right now. Like for me, I don't understand why any company. Of course, I guess some jobs have to be on site, right? I mean, you know, mm -hmm. if you're a nurse, plumber, have site. But so many job descriptions will say on site. You think it'd be more like more flexible, like on site, but may be remote on case by case basis, right? Because they won't want to work. Mm -hmm. They're automatically pass up your pass up your job, right? Now, of course, you know some jobs, you know maybe your, your what your position is, you know, or what it is. But most jobs give you remote, like yeah. Well, it's it's what was it? I saw a TikTok recently because I make a lot of TikTok videos, and the TikTok video was someone being like. Okay, so, you know, they're in the office and they're like, oh, we have a meeting. And they're like, yeah, we have a meeting, but it's on Zoom. And you're like, well, what are you talking about? Oh, well, some people are at home, so we're all going to hop on Zoom. 
and then the person's like well then why am i in the office <laughs> yeah exactly. if i'm just gonna be on that, yeah. zoom anyway yeah, but know, now yeah. i'm in the like this makes no sense as to why i'm here and Ooh. i don't think a lot of companies have realized like why do you even want your staff back in the office? Are you just there to babysit them? Oh, Are no. you just there? Like, what, what is their purpose of them being there? Oh, well, um, you know, there's more energy when they're in the office. You, you, it takes them potentially one to two hours to get to work. Easily. I know people that are money. saving two grand two grand to three grand just on like commuting and time. Yeah. Wouldn't you rather them devote that time to work you know, rather than the commuting into work. And this is my thing. If software developers building a software product can work remote, then everyone should be able to work remote. Because you yeah. think software developers, they be the main ones, them the designers have to be in the same room, whiteboarding and stuff, collaborating at the same time. But they're figuring it out. There's no reason no one else should be able to figure out. And the other part that I find interesting is like, there's a lot of bosses that at one point said before the pandemic, no, you can't work at home. You're not going to be productive at home. And then the pandemic hit and then people were productive at home. And, and, and now even, and even more productive, even more, more productive. And now these middle managers actually, you realize they don't have a purpose. They don't, they don't. <laughs> they, they add like whatever power they did have was in the office when they micromanaged and now they can't micromanage. So they don't know what to do. And it's, you know, and that's the problem because then all of a sudden you're like, what, why are you here? I don't understand. What are you and, doing? And plus for? how good a job were they doing? Cause most staff will show you the most people only work 20 out of the 40 hours working, right? The rest of the time on Facebook, exactly. talking, BS around. Yeah. So were you really a good middle manager if people only working 20 hours a week? Like, right. Right. Because I mean, also people have to realize you can't do like eight hours of real work. No. Most people can only do, you know, studies show only do four hours of deep work. So if that is the case, what do you want your staff to focus on? Right. And I think, yeah, we just, it's so, it's just, it's so antiquated how we've approached work for like the last hundred years <laughs> and, then, and then talk about deep work if you're working office you're working in an open cubicle space right yeah i mean how are you even doing deep work every two minutes someone's coming up hey can you buy my daughter's girl scout <laughs> cookies hey how about the right. how about the football team how about you know so how are you really able to get to go to deep work you probably not no i mean the the uh what was it there's a there's an author that wrote a book uh called uh bull i think bs jobs either that or bullshit bullshit jobs um and i'm trying to see who yeah his name was david graber he's a anthropologist and he he uh found that you know i don't actually like you know the terms that he kind of uses, but like but he has all these various people that are just kind of pushing paper from one place to another and one of the groups he refers to is like task managers uh people who manage or create extra work those who do not need it, like middle management, leadership professionals, you know, just like they're just middle people. And he, he found that like 40 to 50 percent of jobs currently in the U.S. are BS jobs, like meaning if you took the job away tomorrow, the company would not miss it. <laughs> I know, I know being in the army, one bad thing about being in the army, an army would have meetings to prepare for meetings. So example, we had a meeting at 1 p.m. on Monday morning. We would have a pre-meeting like a Friday at three in the afternoon to rehearse everything we're going to do at the meeting, right? It, it's such a big waste of time, but it's like in the army culture, right? Because you, you don't want to be unprepared when the you know, high-ranking people come, right? But that's just a kill me. Right. Right. But then there's always the post meeting, too, where people debrief yeah, and talk I, stuff about the meeting that happened. You're like, can you believe yeah. that happened at the meeting? Like, I, I, I know. So I know he said this, but what he really meant was this. Are you? Are yeah, you, but what he really sure? meant. Yeah. So are we got to sure? talk. I we heard gotta him say read. this. We all heard him say this. Let's debrief what he just said. It's just like and that's another thing. Right. Like I, I say this a lot with psychological safety and like and playing at work. One of the best ways to like get your staff to, you know, play more at work or feel psychologically safe, cancel, cancel meetings. You have too many meetings and the meetings that you have, like you don't even know a lot of times the purpose of it. Oh, well, we just meet because this is what we've always done. Why? You know, and then also why are meetings an hour long? Like yeah. who came up with that? No, it's an arbitrary number. It is like if the meeting only needs to be 11 minutes, make it 11 minutes and then give them the rest of their day back, you know, um, 
Yeah, I know. Suppose I, I remember hearing this somewhere. I don't know how true it is, but suppose Elon Musk is everyone is company permission. Like, if you, if you if you get invited to a meeting and you get there, and you realize you can add no value and no purpose, just leave, right? <laughs> so uh, if that's true or not, I don't know. But that's maybe that'd be a great rule if it is true. I think that would be a great. I think that's a great rule, right? I think a lot of times we have meetings just to hear ourselves speak. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you need to know, don't say anything, but you know, you, you might get some knowledge Well, he can email me. Right. I, I don't know. Yeah. 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 There's so many, so many meetings that could, could have been emails. It's just, yeah. So back to the toxic part. I think, so I think a lot of companies get wrong too. So you know, right now people say, well, um, people quit because, because of, of the bad boss, right? I'll push yeah. back as I'll, I'll push back. Some say, are they quitting because of the bad boss or are they quitting because that company is tolerating bad bosses? Right. Well, yeah, exactly. And what, I, what I mean is like, you know, what, what happens all the time, I, well, I think it does. Several people quit from your company and they all, all complain about Tom. Well, yep. I know people complaining about Tom, but Tom's been for eight years and he's performed for us. Right. So it yep. can't be Tom. Are you sure? Like three or four people have complained about him, you know, whatever the case may be. He has, he has the highest tumor rate, but yet you're not, it's not Tom, right? Like, can, how can it not be Tom? And I think a lot of people get that wrong and they're sending the wrong message to everyone. Yeah. Um, Simon Sinek, uh, you know, that, that thought leader that wrote the book Start With Why talks about that Tom as the brilliant jerk. Yes. Um, yes. And it's the guy that brings in all the money or a lot of the money, right, in his toxic way. And people think, well, as long as he's bringing in money, he must be great. And then they promote that Tom to management because they're like, well, he was such a great performer, which is always a really bad uh, choice that a lot of companies make where they promote someone just because they produce really well. They can also lead. And that's a totally different mindset, right? That's a just so then. And what's interesting, what uh, Simon would say about the brilliant jerk, it's like the Navy SEALs will never pick the brilliant jerk, regardless of how fit, how strong, how brave, how smart the person is. Because when you bring the brilliant jerk into a team like the Navy SEALs, it actually destroys the team. So I think we have to identify, okay, is the brilliant jerk really benefiting you at the cost of the three or four people that quit? Because if Tom is bringing in like $1.5 million, but he also got three to four people to quit and it costs you half a million dollars a person, you know, just in turnover and then tree training and, you know, getting them up to speed and all that stuff, not to mention all the hassle. Then like Tom's actually costing you $2 million. He might be bringing in 1.5 million, but he's costing you two. Are you okay with $500,000 leaving your pocket? And when you present it that way to your bosses, that's a total a uh, mind shift for them. And on top of that, is everyone else really performed to the full potential? Are they are they holding back? Like I'm not I'm not doing the best I yeah. can because that'll make this brilliant joke look good. So I'm just gonna do the bare minimum. Yeah. And being that I think you're you're in Seattle, right? Or around yes. Seattle. Seattle. Yeah. yeah. So you know that happened with um uh Alex Rodriguez. Uh he used to play for the Seattle Mariners, um kind of a toxic guy. He leaves team gets better. Ken Griffey Jr. same thing. Like these like people that draw so much energy once they left it gave everyone else permission to actually step up and be leaders themselves so we really have to be looking at that so jeff next what can you define workplace bullying what does that mean to you yeah i define workplace bullying as making it uncomfortable for a staffer by using your hierarchy um, and using your power to um, kind of hold it over them. So like an example of that would be, you know, even if you're not in a position of power, but you have seniority being like, you know, you, you're more likely to cut people off at meetings. You're more likely to make fun of people like on the side. You're more likely to, um, uh, what is it? take credit for work that's not your work, right? And then a lot of times, you know, a lot of the workplace bullying happens, it's very subtle. It's a lot of just like side jokes and side comments and, you know, and especially if it's like toxic, if it's like toxic masculinity, it's making like, you know, objectifying somebody. Um, 
like yeah, throwing, and then, like, and throwing then, shade someone's direction, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And then it's and then it gets to the point where that person actually feels like physically ill to go to work because they know that it's like they're not comfortable there. They know they might get harassed. They might they might get, you know, um, cut off at a meeting or not heard. Um, and then they know they might they might get made fun of. Can can peers workplace workplace bully each other? Yeah, absolutely. Because again, even because there's seniority in like like um, like I arrived here six months before you, or I'm friends with the boss, so I can joke and you don't. I think a lot of times we don't recognize the the power dynamics that actually exist. Oh, I'm you know uh, everyone else looks like me, right? Like let's say it's all men in the office, and there's just one woman in the office, or our couple, you know it's real or you know you're a minority you don't feel as if you're being represented right so everyone's going to listen to chad and tom but no one wants to listen to me so what would you respond to people say well i understand the workplace will only take place but you need to be mentally strong and stand up for yourself and handle it that way i think it's both i think but i think that person needs to understand whether or not they can sometimes if you're getting bullied by you know someone on a senior level you don't want to talk back to them because you think you might lose your job you think you might like you might get a lower bonus or you might get a poor performance evaluation so a lot of times the someone that is saying something like that is in a position of power the people that are in a position of power should be constantly looking at how am i using my power to actually create a safe playground for my staff to like speak up and if you don't know if that's the case, you should be talking, you should ask your staff directly and be like, do you feel as if you can bring up issues that are really may make you feel or may make the company feel uncomfortable with me? You know, can you can we have hard conversations? When was the last hard conversation that I actually had with my staff? If you if you're like, if it's three to three months or six months, it's too long since you've had that. And, and you know a lot of times when a staff member is like, is not doing well. Like you can just see it by their body language, how they're acting, how they're interacting with other people. You just have to be more observant. And some people will say, well, if you don't like the job, just quit, right? But everyone's economic situation is not allowed to quit, right? You might have mortgage, you might have stuff going on. Everyone just can't quit their job on a whim, you know? Yeah, I mean, everyone doesn't have the luxury, right? Everyone doesn't have the privilege to just up and quit, right? You know, I think a lot of times and you see this a lot on like Instagram and other social media, it's just like, I quit my job and then I travel the world. And it's just like, <laughs> OK, who's funding that? Like your yeah. parents, and, like, and, you know, and what, you know and what's, like, what's your definition of traveling the world? You know, exactly. Like, like where, where, where are you getting? Oh, hold on here. Where are you getting all of this, um, you know, all of this? Yeah, yeah, privilege, right? So you, I think we have to be. Yeah, are, getting, you, stay, are you are you are you, are you uh, like hitchhiking everywhere and, and staying in hostels? Yeah, exactly. Like, like, or, you know how? Yeah, how are you? Even if it's not the part about like the hostels part, it's just the idea of like how how easy do you think it is for someone to just bounce to just like up and go? And I think the more we have a little bit more compassion for staffers just like you know listen i'm in a toxic work situation right now and i need my leadership to step up and help me to make it so that i don't feel as if this is like the worst place for me to work and i think a lot of times and you know we've talked about this like offline it's just like so you sometimes have bosses that are just like not equipped to be leaders <laughs> I know. I mean, somebody said, somebody forget to get, get, you know, promoted to manager. They had get no management training, no people training. No, that kind of no stuff, you know? management training. Like, what are you doing? Like, how is that? Yeah. How is that even? Oh, yeah. So I just don't understand. I don't understand, kind of, man. This kind of a subject. So, one of my pet peeves is this, right? And it happens all the time. Like, some big company or startup will have like some kind of, you know, the, the, the CEO will do something wrong, something like, you know, most common examples are, you know, like, um, the, the former CEO of Zenefits, the former CEO of, you know, of um, Uber, the former CEO of WeWork, you know, they did some pretty bad things, right? And I don't know where people say, where was HR at? How come HR didn't stop this, you know? Yep. And, I, and my thing was always like, I'm pretty sure 9.9% of the time the HR person went to them and said, hey, boss, this isn't the right thing to do, you know? 
but another thing too, a lot of people think HR works for the employees. HR works for the company, right? So they're, you know, exactly. they, they work for the employee, right? And then once again, you know, everyone just can't quit a job on principle. You know, you can't say, hey, you know, CEO, you're doing these illegal things. If you don't stop, I'm going to quit my $200,000 year job with the KSB, right? Yep. And it's always just put on HR's plate. But I could be wrong, of course, but I just think a lot of times HR does their job, says what they need to say, because once again, HR can't make decisions, they can only recommend. And these, you know, quote unquote, bad bosses keep them doing bad things. But when it comes to light, first thing people say, where's HR? Like they were yep. right there trying to do the right thing. But, you know, you got more of these kids in school or where do the case be? You just can't quit your job. Well, the thing is, is like HR gets a bad rap. I feel bad a lot of times because it gets it gets the crap from both sides. Right. It's just like you have to watch out for me as the as the employee. Hey, you have to watch out for the company, you know, and our liability. Like it's constantly having to put out all the fires that are created by other departments, right? Like it's ridiculous that there could be toxicity in the marketing department. And instead of like the leaders in that department addressing it and removing that toxic person or having mediated conversations, they throw it to HR and they're like, hey, HR, can you solve this? You know, like, and then I think what you said earlier, right? We have got into this mode of celebrating the toxic leader, right? The leader at Uber, the leader at WeWork, um, Theranos right now at uh, better.com with Vishal, like all like the Wolf oh, of Wall Street. All, I forgot, I all forgot these... about the better.com guy. Wait, yeah, that was, just, he, that was oh, and that, uh, let's get into that in a moment because that's yeah. really interesting. But but just like all of these horrible, you know, a holes, um, and people running are still money in them. People are still getting millions and millions of dollars. Yeah, You're like, what's right. wrong with Running you? amok, the bri- they're all represented as the brilliant jerk. And at any time, they can fire anybody. So, you, so of course, HR probably brought up to Uber really early on, hey, like Uber didn't even have an HR department at the beginning. And yeah. they were like, you know, you might want to have an HR department. Well, we don't have staff. You know, they're all contractors. Well, you still are. You might be violating some issues. I mean, it took them like a year to actually call together an actual HR staff. Like, you know, so much of the time we put HR like the last thing and we, then we don't invest enough money into it to actually help people. So, you know, or we are like, hey, HR, help us with professional development. Um, but we're not going to give you the funds to do it. Or frankly, because you don't have the power, because a lot of time HR doesn't have the power. They, what you said, they only have suggestions. You know, we can only do so much to address that toxic leader. We can't train them to not be toxic. They just have to make a decision whether they don't want to be anymore. Um, and that's a rough spot for HR to be in. Yeah, a lot of time the employees, they have a whole picture. So my first job, first army, I was an HR manager for a seafood company out of Alaska, right? My first mm-hmm. day there, I had 200 people on my door to complain about the, about the managers, right? 200 people like, what in the world's going on, right? Is this that bad here? This was the biggest complaint. Uh, my supervisor is yelling at me. I was like, okay, is he yelling at you? Or is he talking loud because you have these, you know, all the safety gear on, all the air gear <laughs> on, and there's a lot of machinery where the fish go through. Oh, I never thought about, that. I thought about that. So he's not yelling at me. Probably not, you know? So this, those are little kinds of things too, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and again, that like you just calm down a situation. You just put out a fire that really wasn't a fire, but like, you know, it was like such a miscommunication. HR has to be like that mediator all the time. Um, and then tying back into the Vishal Garg thing. For, so, so for anyone that doesn't know, there's this guy named Vishal Garg, super toxic leader, once threatened the life of his co um co-ceo at another company well anyway you know he runs uh better.com and uh i think maybe it's a month month and a half ago he went on zoom i, I know it was before even, christmas yeah you know, even yeah before christmas yeah even even after hr told him not to do this went on zoom and he laid off 15 percent of his staff via zoom and, and, and the worst I, and- and then his like all his public relations marketing people quit too after that too. Yeah, yeah. So so first, what happened is like imagine you're on Zoom, and he's on Zoom literally saying to people like, um, yeah, "Yeah, I have some bad news to tell you." And actually, this is really hard for me. I've had to do this before, um, and this is going to be hard. But I'm gonna hold it together. So he was making it all about him, like how yeah. painful it was for him. 
And then all of a sudden he goes, yeah, but if you're on this call, then your term, your, you know, job is terminated effective immediately, effective after this call. So anyone that was at home, their email was shut down. Immediately, they couldn't yeah. access the net. They couldn't connect or say goodbye to anybody at all. They were just completely shut off. And this was so unique to like the pandemic in the sense of like, you're stuck at home. And then all of a sudden you're like, I don't have the. I don't have the personal numbers of any of my friends at this job. This is like the weirdest thing. Um, so it was so cold and callous. And then what you said, right? The PR, the whole PR and communications team, which also tried to advise them, quit the next day because they didn't listen to them anyway. And then finally the board, three or four days later after Forbes and uh, what is it? Fast Company and all these companies, just all these magazines just ripped him. And, and the only reason this came out is because someone filmed this on TikTok and posted it. Yeah. They told, they say he, he, um, what is it? He's taking a sabbatical. He's taking a, taking some time off to like rethink two weeks ago, he came back. They brought him back. And all of a, all of a sudden, all these other people started quitting because they thought the company was changing. And then they're like, Nope, we're picking the brilliant jerk over the employees. So more people are not leaving. And it's just like, why? Like, and why would you do that? Is he really a brilliant jerk? Because like, I could be wrong, but a lot of companies have not really made it right. He's always like failed and he's great. He's great at raising money. You're going to be wrong. They give him money. He raises for a lot of money. I don't know if they're successful, but he raises a lot of money. How? I don't know. I don't know. Just like uh, the guy for, who's in fits. I think it was the name, you know. Um, yeah. He got, he got tossed out. And then he raised yep. even money for more money for another HR platform. Like... I mean, it was so bad there. Of course, you only go by what you see in the papers and news. You know, you know I wasn't there, but I suppose they had a rule where no sex in the in the hallway. Like you have to have a rule, no sex in the stairwell. Like, are you kidding me right now? Right? Yeah. It was like the it was like the bro the frat bro culture to the extreme, right? But yep. they, they got rid of him and pretty much based the same company, he raised even more money, right? You're like, what's yeah. going on? Yeah, yeah. I, I had a friend who worked at Zenefits, and she was like, yeah, it's horrible here. <laughs> and then you know, all the illegal stuff that he's you know allegedly did like the, the fake insurance licensing and all that kind of stuff you know yep I, I don't know and then you got people like struggling to raise money and they're like can i get a dime yeah you know? exactly yeah i just i mean and maybe it's the old boys network i don't really know you know i think what's interesting right now i don't know if you like you know uh, pay attention to the nfl at all but like just was it yesterday, just yesterday or the day before um, um, an offensive coordinator by the name of Brian Flores just yeah, sued lawsuit, the NFL, yeah. Yeah. you know, and he just filed this lawsuit and he filed this lawsuit, even though he's applying to other jobs with the NFL, you know, and there's a lot of like details to the lawsuit, but the main crux of it is they institute something called the Rooney rule back in 2003, where they would say, Hey, you know, whenever you're interviewing for a coaching or um, administrative job, like general manager or above, you have to interview X amount of minority candidates. Um, and that they assume by doing this, you would hire more minority coaches. But now there's but right a lot now of there's, Sam, one, Sam there's one black coach in the whole NFL. That's it. Yeah. One. Mike Toppin from the Steelers. Yeah. And, and then it, right now there is were eight vacancies at the beginning of like, you know, I don't know, January for the, all these coaching jobs, five of them have been selected and yeah. not one um, black coach has even been considered. And a few of the ones that are up, like have won Super Bowls, have like have a better track record than a lot of the people that are getting picked. You know, this guy Urban Meyer from college got picked before someone that had brought a team to four AFC championships and two Super Bowls. And you're like, why are you just grab it? Like, is this an old boys club? Like, this just yeah. seems like we're doing like, it all over like again. there's no reason Eric Benemi from the Chiefs. Exactly. That's coach. the guy I'm referring to. Yep. And then Brian Flores, I was like, how did Brian Flores get fired from the Dolphins? He had back to back winning season. Things were getting exactly. get fired. Then you know, he came out and then you find out that like his then you find out that his owner offered to pay him a hundred thousand dollars a game to lose. Yeah. Like and then he was going to fire like and then Hugh Jackson. That's how he got fired. It's like he was told to lose. He lost. And then they were like, good. Now we can get rid of you. Like, oh, man. And then do you hear what they had in the paper with Brian Flores that saying he went to an interview with the Denver Broncos like a year ago, whatever. 
and everyone from the Broncos sort of drunk, drunk and hungover. Including and, then John said, and then they said, no, 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 no. We were very professional. And he was like, no, you weren't. <laughs> It's just craziness, right? And it's then, like, the, he had the, crazy. of course, the thing, like, you get the, the the text from Bill Belichick said, hey, congrats, I heard they're going to pick you for the for the job. Oh, my mistake. Yeah. It's the other Brian. And Brian Flores was like, well, I haven't even interviewed yet, so how are they going to pick someone else, right? Yeah. No, he's there. Yeah. Just, they already picked the other Brian. He's just there for a sham, you know, so they can you know, check the black, so to speak. There's so much of that. I really hope, you know, something comes from this. Um, but the other part that I think I think is really important is, um, you know, for anyone that is listening is like, what is your company actually doing, you know, in regards to diversity, you actually make more money, like studies have shown you make all, more money. All the, when you all have the a, studies show that, all you know, the when you that. have a more diverse staff. So, you know, and when I say like, not just diversity, like token diversity, I'm talking about like, what does your board of directors look like? What is your like your top level management look like or your top level leadership. You know, um, I, I once worked with um, an engineer and she was working for an engineering company and they were trying to figure out how to, um, it was like for a med- biomedical engineering company and they were trying to figure out how to make a new stent and they couldn't figure it out and it was mostly dudes. And she came up with this idea of like, oh, well, why don't you use something that's similar to a scrunchie? And they were like, what's a scrunchie? And she's like, a scrunchie, the thing that holds you, holds your hair up. You know, I have like a ton of them. She just like pulled one out and like threw it on the table. They were like, what is that? And like, they were able to figure out a brand new patent for a stent based off of that idea. And like ideas like that are available when you bring diversity to the table. Yeah, one thing, I think a lot of, a lot of people mess up and they try to like, convince a company to do diversity based on social impact i think yeah. they didn't present the business case as equal to social impact you know yeah yeah because I, yeah i mean i mean at the end of the day i get it if you need to make more money then all right make more money but then it's just like but that toxic person's not bringing you in more money there's perception they are but it's not like in the long run you're not going to be around like the longevity of your like i know you need to meet quarterly results but what's more important you know, you being around in five years or you hitting your metrics for three quarters? Yeah, I think a lot of companies mess up too. I think a lot of companies say, we're going to do diverse hiring. It's not the easier, right? I mean, you just can't say, hey, no. I'm going to go hire uh, someone from this demographic, right? First of all, they need to be qualified for the job, you know? They have to want to work for your company. And there's a whole mix, you know, you got to reach out to them, you know? It's it's not, I think too many people, oh, I'm, I'm going to get, do diverse hiring. It's a little more complicated than that, I think. Yeah, and I think a lot of times, you know, and this is, you know, one sometimes for for like um you know i i used to go to this thing called uh nesby the national society of black engineers um because i was a, formerly an engineer and that was where all the engineering companies recruited all of their people of color that one conference that's it for the whole year and i was like you can't be just going to this one conference to get all your black and brown folk and then just be like, okay, we're done with diversity hires for the year. Like, what is your relationship with like, you know, HBCUs? Like, what are, what are you doing on a regular basis to outreach, you know, so that you can find a diverse group? Because I think a lot of times we're just like, oh, I'm just going to contact my friend went to that university. So I'm going to start recruiting from there. And we got to come on, We got to be a little bit more creative at this point. And, and what happens too, like they're hired, we'll say they're hired as a Hispanic, as a Hispanic female, right? Next week. Hey, Hispanic female, you need to sit on all the interview panels now to help us get more Hispanic yeah. people. Like, yeah. I didn't get hired to be an interview expert, right? I, I got hired to do this job, right? What, are you kidding right now? Like, yeah, yeah. Like, we need you in all the brochures. We need you at every single brochure, you know, and on the website. And it's just like, come on, man. Let's let's stop doing performative act- activism. Let's stop doing performative hires and be like, and I get it. Like, hire the best piece of people possible. But what I'm saying is just like, you're not looking hard enough to find yeah, I'm, I'm a firm believer you can have a diverse work set and still have the best person, right? Absolutely. I mean, like you said, there's so much talent at HBCUs. There's so much talent at smaller colleges, right? There's so much talent everywhere, right? I mean, if, you, if you're if you a company and you always recruit at you know, Stanford or Harvard or uh, what's it called? A predominantly white school. That's all you're going to okay. get, right? You have to yeah. go different places sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Like just, yeah. There's people... Teams have to be taking bigger risks in order to diversify their staff. 
and I'm thinking about like I'm going with the stops a lot. You know, of course the stops is kind of it's a it's a it's a trick situation, right? Because you most people want to do diverse stuff, right? But can you really afford like do diverse recruiting, diverse hiring? Your four or five six hours because you waste your time hiring, or do you want to bring on the people you know, trust, build the product up, get funding, and then do diverse hiring, right? So, I, but then you have like you know we'll say we have like ten females then, right? And you got to you know you know recruit a guy or non white female, right? And then, then is it too late, right? Does if you're like a, outside that you know, that zone, so to speak, do you really want to be the only demographic going to the startup, right? With the culture already yeah. built. So yeah. I, I think it's a tricky situation for startup founders, right? I mean, it is to a point because, but but also there's a certain type of like laziness, right? There's a certain type of like, let me just hire people that look exactly like me. Like I think I would ask as a leader, like look at your staff right now. If they look like you. You're not doing, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, I used to run, um, you know, these events uh, at Amazon Web Services, you know, Las Vegas event. Um, and this was like 2016, 2017. And I remember I was at, I don't know, one of the, you know, hotels or whatever. And by accident, I I walked into the, the women's restroom instead of the guys, I wasn't looking. And then obviously I like walked right out. But then I was like, wait a minute. I was like, there's no women at this conference. Like there's like, that's an indicator. this is 2017. And where are women in tech? Like this is not 2002. And just like, it's sad that we are this lazy that we do not think that there are not enough talented women in STEM that should be leading organizations. And it should at least be 20 to 40% more women at these conferences. Yeah. And if you're doing those events, what are you doing? Like, you know, entice women to come. Like if you have an event and it's like a keg of beer, you know, and, you know, and the bourbon, you know, yep. like, I don't know. You're not just sending the right missions, I think. So next, Jeff. So you're all about player work, but isn't yeah. work supposed to be work? Like you never say how fun at work. Why work should be work, right? Get the job done, go home. Why? I mean, why, it can be. Why do you want I mean, to have fun at work? I, I want to have fun at work because I, I'm there 2,000 to 2,500 hours a year. You know, like, you know, and uh, Alex Johnson would say this um, in his book, Wonderful, um, the future is where people are having the most fun. You know, you, you want to look for innovation, like you want to like be on the cutting edge, then you need to be doing the stuff that's most interesting, you know. Uh, you know, I, I don't vouch for Jeff Bezos now. I think he's like super toxic. But at the beginning, when Amazon was just coming together in 98, so many people wanted to work with him because he was tackling the most interesting issues in the tech world at the time, right? He was just trying, like, can we sell books online? Can we sell other things online? Can we actually create a marketplace online? And people are like, I want to work for, I want to solve that problem. And if you think about how many, most companies started, they started off by playing right? Like I reference Google's 20% rule. Google used to do this 20% rule where they would give their staff a fifth of their time to pursue whatever they wanted as long as it benefited Google, right? So they could pursue many curiosities. What came from that? AdSense, Gmail, um, Google News, like foundational aspects of Google that have basically brought so much money in, came from play. And then on top of that, another benefit of playing at work is like staff are 500% staff are more productive. So when your staff is doing their zone of genius, the work where they forget about time, the work where they're like actually in flow, because I define play as any joyful act where you forget about time, really that, that has no purpose, has no result, right? You're just like in love with the process. When your staff is doing that, that flow work, 500% more productive, like studies show five times more productive, you know, what, what happens when that happens? Higher retention, you know, higher productivity, um, people that actually want to come to work, you know, better, a higher psychological safety because people are enjoying their job more. Like, it's just like, it just, and it's just like better energy in the, on the team, you know? So all these things just make more sense. Like, if more people were playing at work, we wouldn't have had such a huge turnover during the great resignation. But most people are like, this, this is not worth it. 
I'm not even enjoying my life. I'm kind of just like selling out for 2000 hours a year for, am I doing this for the rest of my life? Like this doesn't sound like a good contract to me. Yeah. Like the old, the old metric of metric of, you know, working for the same company, 40 hours a week, 40 hours for 40 years, the 65, then do what you want for 10 years. I mean, you know, by that and time you're die? 65 and die, yeah. <laughs> and you're 65, can you really enjoy life? You might be, you know, bad bag pain, you know, can you really travel yeah. and do stuff at 65? You know, maybe you can, maybe you can't. And you're giving me two to three weeks vacation? That's it? Like, you know, Canada and Australia, Australia gives a month. You know, like, like a lot of us, we have to start looking at like, what are we doing? Like, why are we, and the people, and think about it, even in America, people have two, three weeks vacation. Many of them don't even take that vacation, yeah. right? Like, and we think we're more productive here in America because we put in so many more hours, right? Like, I think we're averaging, I don't know, it's like 42 or 44 hours a week. We're not more productive. Like Finland just instituted four day work weeks they're just as productive as us, you know? So I think a lot of companies need to start looking into like, can we do a shorter work day? Can we do four days out of the week? What does that actually look like? But I'm still paying them for five days. Will I get actually more out of your staff? Probably. He'll probably get more out of them. So Jeff, you did a, a video on this and we're talking about TikTok, TikTok, TikTok later on, but you did a TikTok about fun. You need to have fun, but it can't be forced fun. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Like the thin line between that those two things yeah so so i hate forest fun i i used to run team building events for you know a lot of those companies that you mentioned earlier and if someone doesn't want to play you shouldn't force them to play like the the magnificent thing about play is the option the choice to play or not play like when you see kids at a playground like not all of them are playing someone's just sitting on the sidelines and be like i'm good here so but when you are forcing your staff to be like, hey, we're all going to happy hour and you need to come to happy hour or, hey, we're all going to go to the escape room and, you know, you're going to be right next to Chad and you're like, I hate Chad. And now <laughs> I got to sit in a room with him and try to escape the room. Like I try to do this during work, work you know, for fun. Like this is painful. Like when you're a team building event and you're not given the option or choice as to whether or not you want to do it, that's not helpful. You know, and I say this, you know, I, I made a bunch of videos around the national fun at work day, but, you know, it was all about like, if your staff, if there's not psychological safety with your staff, meaning like you can't have transparent and open, hard conversations with them, you're not ready to play because play is vulnerable and play is like a privilege that, that usually I only share with my friends, right? So if you're asking me to play, you better have created the playground for me to play. Um, and it should be on my own time. It shouldn't be like, now we're playing, now we're not. Hey, now we're going to make this meeting more fun. It's just like, come on, dude. Like, we're sitting in a box room around a box table, and now you're like trying to bring joy and tell us to think outside the box. Why are we even in this box room if we're trying to think outside the box? This makes no sense. So like me, like I'm an introvert. I'm not really like rah, rah, you know, motivated type of guy. And mm -hmm. I hate like you used to do like these team building events. I always hate them, right? But I would admit every time I finish, I was like, okay, I got something out of it, right? At the end of the day, I'll say, okay, I got something out of it. I got, I see the purpose. But if you give me the decision, yeah. I would never do it, right? I just don't like them, right? Right. But when, once I do them, okay, I'll admit this was fun. I'll admit I got something out of it, you know? I mean, they can be, I mean, and that's the thing. It's like, sometimes they're cringe worthy, right? And then sometimes they might be all right. But like, you know, like, hey, we're going to, at one point, what, what was one of the icebreakers that I saw that was so painful was like people had to like, you know, get their arms and and untangle themselves from each other. And it was just like, I don't want to be this close to somebody. I mean, this is before the pandemic. I don't want so so you got to be aware of like what, you know, type of of. You got to uh, read the crowd, so to speak, right? Yeah, you got to be like I talk a lot about attunement. Um, you know, and uh, attunement is this idea that when you're a, like a baby, that it's the first form of play, actually, when a, a parent holds their child and they actually like look at each other, they actually can become attuned and basically meaning like their brain waves are identical. And 
that happens only when you're young, but then you look for that attunement the rest of that time. You as a leader should be constantly looking for that. You're creating attunement with your staff, being able to understand and, and read the room and understand them without them having to say a lot of stuff. Because I think a lot of times we don't realize like, what do they say? You know, communication is only 10% words. And a lot of it is like tone and body language. And like, you have to be aware of that stuff. And if you're not, then you really are not actually listening to your staff. So Jeff, let's go back to remote work for a minute. So a couple of things like pre-COVID, I was, I was like, I want to do remote work. But the remote work we got was not what we thought, right? You know, we thought remote work would go home, work from the, from the house every day or where I want to. But COVID gave us a remote work plus babysitting. Plus taking yep. care of the grandparents. Yeah. Plus during the pandemic. Plus, yep. plus, plus, right. So I don't really think it's remote work. It's remote work plus, 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 right? Yeah. And another thing, like remote work, I think, what is the definition of that, right? Is it remote work? Like you're, you, we let you work from your house, but you have to answer my email within one minute. Or you have to right. do this in a certain amount of time. Or if you want to go to the store, you got to get permission, right? What yep. really, what, or what really is the definition of remote work? Oh, I think I would consider my definition of remote work is uh, your ability to do work that is not in the office and not in a office format setting where, where hours, hours are not as relevant, right? And you do work at when you, you know, the healthy way of doing remote work is you do work when you when it's most optimal to you. Um, and I think that's the part that was really difficult for a lot of like leaders to figure out because they're like, hey, I expect my staff to be on call from like 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And it's just like, well, what if I have to pick up my kids, right? What if, the, what if you, know, um, you know, right now one of them's having like a nervous breakdown and I need to address that, right? And frankly, like, now, because we've now been it for like two years, you know, you have staff that like go to the grocery store during the day. Does that mean they can't get their work done? They're still getting their work done, you know? So I, I think we need, I think leaders need to let go of the, rig, the rigidity of remote work where I need you on call for me to access at all times. I think that is antiquated ways of thinking. So Jeff, next thing about this, and this is something I struggle with, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people struggle with this, right? Like your inner critic just destroying you, right? Your inner critic yeah. being negative, your inner critic, how, what's some advice on dealing with your inner critic? Because I think like you're your own worst critic, right? Yeah, so that is a fascinating subject. I do a whole workshop called playing with your inner critic. And, you know, I go through like a whole technique with a lot of people. So you, I, I think a lot of times people, People think their inner critic is this horrible thing that um, you need to get rid of. And the reality is you can't because your inner critic stems from like, from the psychological sense of like, it's there to protect you, you know? Like it's like, we have a negativity bias and an ability to constantly be asking ourselves, are we safe? Am I safe? Am I safe? Like you're constantly asking yourself that throughout the day. Oh, someone's coming up to me. Am I safe? Well, I'm at work. Am I safe? You know, I'm about to go into this meeting. Am I safe? You know, so it's there designed in your brain for a purpose to protect you. So that's great. It's good that it's there. What I think we've realized is now that we're not cavemen, right? And we're not, you know, having to, you know, fend off animals. We are, we have our inner critic running amok and it's constantly, you know, taking up space in our mind. Um, and we need to be aware of when we need to listen to it and when we don't. And we need to actually almost be friends with it. Um, it's interesting, Elizabeth Gilbert, this author that wrote Eat, Pray, Love, and uh, this book, Big Magic, talks about in her book, Big Magic, how she writes a letter to fear whenever she's about to take on a new project. And she literally writes a letter to fear and says to fear, like, hey, I'm going on this trip with creativity. You're happy to, you're more than welcome to come. 
but you are not allowed to, you know, you're ha- you're more than welcome to be in the car, but you're not allowed to touch the radio. You're not allowed to drive the car. You're not allowed to like give us suggestions. You can be here, but I'm probably not going to be listening to you. You get to sit in the back seat. And that's kind of like the relationship that you actually have to have with it. So a technique that I tell a lot of people to do that I learned from uh, this person at Cassiana Bar um, that I was doing some work with at one point, she would tell me, whenever you're feeling crappy about yourself, right? Like you're binge watching Netflix, you're like eating a lot of Cheetos, you're just feeling like you're just feeling crappy about you. Stop for a moment, whatever you're doing, and just start listening to your inner critic and writing down what it's saying to you. So like, oh, you're the worst. Oh, you're a loser. Oh, look at you, you're so fat. Oh, you're, you're broke. Oh, you know, you're full of BS. No, one, no, no one's ever going to love you. You know, all the things, just start writing them down, right? Because that awareness is super powerful. So then once you write it down, start to then think, okay, where is, what is this voice? Like whose voice does this represent? Is this a high school bully? Is this someone from third grade? Is it so a mean teacher? Is it my parents? Is it some like, you know, sibling? Like what is this voice that's coming, right? And once you identify what it's saying to you and what the voice is saying to you, then you start to ask like, okay, well, what does it also look like? Does it, you know, does it look like Chad from the office? Like you start to like come up almost with a character for it. And then a powerful thing that you do that I learned from uh, my friend, Marsha Shandor, is that you name it, you name this inner critic. So my inner critic's Gargamel. And then right when I notice Gargamel, what I'll sometimes do is either I'll write down what Gargamel's saying, or I'll text my best friend Dana and be like, hey, Gargamel's saying this to me right now. She doesn't even need to text me back. Just the idea of me writing it down and telling somebody else, all of a sudden I start to see this list of all these mean things that I'm saying to myself. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, wait a minute, I'm not broke. I'm actually doing quite well. Wait a minute, people do love me. I'm surrounded by people who love me. Wait a minute, I know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm not, I'm not an expert on everything, but I can talk about this, I'm, you know, and you start to ask yourself, you know, Byron Katie would do this, like, is this true? Is this always true? This is actually not true. This is BS. And that's when you start to like befriend that inner critic because you're, you're listening to it. You're like, okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me know Gargamel that I'm a horrible piece of crap. And okay, I've heard you now I'm going to keep going and doing whatever I was doing before. And then the last thing you can do with your inner critic is all the mean things that you wrote to yourself. You can start to flip them. So do the opposite, start to write the opposite. Like, oh, no one loves me. Oh, I'm surrounded by people that love me. Um, my business is not doing well. Um, my business will be doing well. And, you know, and I'm taking big risks in order to do it. You know, and you start to flip those and you start to say those things to yourself on a regular basis. All of a sudden you start to empower your inner child, that inner cheerleader. And, it, and then your inner critic starts to get quiet and your inner child starts to get more loud. Yeah, I definitely think that you got to take advantage of the critic because I could, I could be wrong, but I think like, you know, people we consider like quote unquote go track, like Tom Brady, um, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, Denzel Washington. I'm pretty sure they utilize their inner critic to motivate them and, you know, push them on to greater things. Yeah, they do. But I think they do it in a way that also is like, you know, they're constantly listening to their inner child or their, their inner cheerleader because like Jordan what shot like, 30 game winners and miss like a majority of them you know like early on this in his career but there's a voice in his head that's like you're gonna make the next one you know like you're gonna make the next like the same thing with like brady it's just like you're gonna make the next pass it's like the as much as probably they're hearing that mean voice they're hearing something else that's like we're doing this like you know i have the confidence in myself I'm Kobe Bryant. I have the confidence in myself that, yeah, I can score 81 points. It's like, no problem, you know? So Jeff, let's talk about this. So right now, you know, in office, we're talking about office politics, office situations, you know, right now the office is like all over the place. Like there's like pro this, anti this, people on the left, people mm-hmm. on the right, this opinion, that opinion. How does someone like negotiate all that in the, in the office space, right? Like, like, like how do you like not get involved? Like, okay, this part office saying they're pro this, office is pretty anti this. 
how do you yeah. like stay out of that so to speak right and still be and are involved? you talking about like the politics like whether it's like black lives matter or all, all, you know, everything everything like trump and all that stuff yeah, yeah i think I think you have to like identify like what actually ma- what is important and what's not. I think there was there was one company I forgot the name of it now that was just like no politics is allowed to be spoken in this office, and I don't think that is actually a smart approach either, right? You know, I think you have to, you have, like, can you hang signs, political signs in your um, cubicle, for example? I don't know. I feel like that's kind of tough. Um, if it makes, ah, it's tough because I was going to say if it makes the other person uncomfortable, then maybe not. But like that also is where, you know, yeah, I don't know. I, that that part that I think is uh, is hard. I would, if people wanted to talk politics and they want to talk politics at work, I would create avenues or meetings where people if you want to hash it out and do your thing sweet do it over there and we'll have a a space for you to do it but right now you telling me about who you're going to vote for in the next election is not relevant to this meeting so as long as you can have the opportunity for people to do it but not at the expense of their work then i would i would feel like i would allow some leeway in that one thing that kills me all the time, like when I was at an election, right? People go on Facebook, social media. If anyone, you know, says anything positive about this person, this candidate, or I'm, I'm an unfriend you, right? So you're going to unfriend me because we have different political views. We've been friends all this time. And now I want to vote for this other person, whether it's the left or right, Republican, Democrat, you're going to unfriend me. Like, are you kidding me, right? I just never, like, that's already kill, always yeah, kills me. I, well, I think the thing that's, I think, really challenging right now is like, especially in America, we don't know how to have difficult conversations. We don't know how to disagree with people. Like, and, and that's really, we, like, we haven't built the skill set to do that. Like, how do I have a conversation while also respecting the other people, person's opinion? How do I have a conversation with someone where we're tackling the problem and not attacking each other's character? Whenever I run my workshop around difficult conversations, we talk about how, like, you're focused on the problem. The problem is over here. The problem is not not you and me. The problem is there's the problem over here and how are we going to get there together? But I think we don't know how to do that. Like we haven't practiced that. And if you think about it, you know, you know, going back to like, you know, NFL or sports in general, but like specifically in the NFL, they practice all week for a three hour game. If you think about for companies, we never get to practice. Like we don't get to practice how to run a meeting. We don't get to practice how to have a difficult conversation. And then we're just thrown in and be like, all right, get to work. So I think we need to build the skills to be able to have a hard conversation, to feel like when someone is saying something that disagrees with me, they're not attacking who I am as a person. And right now we're in such silos that we haven't had the ability to do that. Yeah, another thing too, like post someone's having a, a disagreement or whatever, or negotiating something, and you, you, you get nine out of ten things you want, nine out of ten, but then you still say no because I can't get all ten. Like you get nine out of ten things, right? You can't compromise this one thing. Well, I know that one thing is so important to me. I'm gonna get rid of the other ten. That's something else I never understood yeah. either, right? Yeah, exactly. So next, um, back to the the fun at work. So like, I think most people understand how you have fun when everyone's in the office. How can you have fun and play at work when everyone's remote? How does that work? So, uh, you know, I said one of the ones already, right? Is first, before you even start to play at work, make sure that you actually have a psychologically safe workspace, right? So make sure you can actually have difficult conversations. Make sure that you're being transparent with your staff. Ask your staff, can we have hard conversations? Are you able to bring up issues? Like, do you avoid bringing me issues because you're like feeling uncomfortable or can you actually, you know, like address this? Like, do you feel comfortable enough to tell me that potentially maybe you're quitting? You know, like, are you comfortable enough to do that? That's the first step that you have to do, right? And then um, my next suggestion, which I said earlier, is like, start canceling meetings. Give staff time. Like, they can't play if they don't have time. So start looking at what meetings are people doing? Also, what work are they doing that's really unnecessary? How many like reports do you write up 
telling you about the work that you're doing. Instead of just being like, can I just do the work that I'm doing? Why do I need to write so many reports updating you about the work that I'm doing? And then write another report for someone else to tell you about the work that I'm doing. You know, there's so much of that. So look at people's schedules and be like, how do we cut more needless work out of their schedules so they can actually play, right? Then finally, when you've done that, then you can be like, okay, you go to your staffs individually and you go, okay, hey, what's, what's the work that you love to do most? What's your zone of genius work as Gay Hendricks refers to as like, you know, a lot of times we talk about how um, he talks a lot about how people have work that is their zone of incompetence, stuff they suck at, zone of competence, things they're average at, zone of excellence, things that they're really good at, but they don't really care to do it either way. They like the praise of it, but they're like, ah, whatever. Like I do it because I'm good at it and I like the praise, but then there's the zone of genius. The work where if they weren't getting paid, they'd still just do this type of work. The work where they forget about time, their flow work. And you're like, okay, what's your zone of genius work? Oh, I love to talk to clients. I love having conversations with clients. I love to connect with them. Okay, what percentage of time do you currently do that work? 15%. 15%. That's, that's all the time you do for, how do we increase that to 20 or 25%? That's like two or three more hours a week. By doing that, all of a sudden your staff starts to become more productive and they're more productive even in the work that they're not good at because there's a ripple effect because they're like, oh, wow, now my leader, I feel seen by my leader. I feel heard and I'm now able to do the work that actually excites me. So that's another way you can get them to play at work, have them focus on their zone of genius. And then the next one is create a playground for them to tackle issues. So the next time you're having a meeting and you're going to do a project and you know how to do the project and we're, we're going to do the project the way we always do the project. Instead, be like, hey, instead of this, listen, I want you to tackle it a brand new way. I want we're going to cancel this meeting for this week. I want you to go. You can do it individually or as part of a team, but I want you to brainstorm a bunch of different ways in which we're gonna tackle this project differently because we have to rethink how we market going forward. We have to rethink how we do sales. We have to rethink how we recruit and hire because we're coming out of this pandemic and everything is in the new normal. All right, and then come to me with your, your ideas, your most interesting, crazy, fascinating ideas. And then we're going to start experimenting with some of them. You know, we're going to have you try them out for like the next week or the next month and see what comes of fruition for that and allow people to fail. Like that's a huge part of play. It's just like, I know not all these ideas are going to work out, but I want us to test a bunch of these out and see what actually comes from this. And that's when you start to build a playground where staff are like, oh, I can actually play. Oh, he's actually giving me the opportunity to play. And that's how you create more play at work. Not just like, hey, let's hula hoop or let's play more ping pong. So Jeff, presuming a 40 hour work week, do you have a recommend, number, recommend, recommend a number of hours per week, per 40 hours they should be having fun at work? No, because again, it's about, it's about it being organic, right? Like it's not, it's, it's not about control. So much of work, we try to control it. And you can't control play, right? You can't control like the organic nature of when someone has an idea that like is an epiphany of theirs. You know, going back to Elizabeth Gilbert for a moment, you know, she would talk about how genius visits you. Like no one's a genius, you know. Uh, after the Renaissance or during the Renaissance period, all of a sudden we were like, Oh, these people are geniuses. Leonardo da Vinci is a genius. Raphael is a genius. Galileo is a genius. But actually, before then, the Romans, and I think the Greeks as well, saw geniuses as, as almost like a muse. It was almost something that visits you. And you get this spark of an idea, and then you need to write it down. And then if you don't create it, then it moves on to somewhere else, right? It's the same thing with play. Like, you allow the playground for organic, creative ideas to show up. But you don't tell people, all right, now we're going to play. Okay, now we're going to be, now we're going to brainstorm and come up with a bunch of ideas. That's the worst time, you know, like you're not creating an environment where creativity can flourish. You're trying to manage creativity, which doesn't make sense. So what's your take on this? You hear all the time people say, at this company, we work hard, play hard. 
is the work hard, play hard mantra really a good thing, bad thing? I hate What's your take that. on that? What? What's play hard? What does that even mean? Like, I don't understand. Like, I, I, I used to do campaign work and they would say that all the time. We could work hard and then we play hard, you know? And I was like, what's play hard? Well, we drink a lot after. Is that play? <laughs> Is it to, to get drunk because you had such an abusive day and that you need to numb yourself and then, you know, have a hangover and then go do it all over again? Is that fun? I don't even know if that's play. I think that's just you coping with the fact that your job sucks. Like this is like, you know, like, like you that's look at hilarious. Fine, you know, I have people in, fi- I know in finance that are like, yeah, you know, I, I love this. And it's just like, you take drugs to like stay awake so you could do your job. Like, I don't think any of that is really fun at all. I think that's just a lot of BS. Anyone that I that I hear saying work hard, play hard, I don't think they actually know how to play, in my opinion, right? I, I don't see those things as play. I see that as coping mechanisms for the pain and suffering that you go through throughout the day. But you're right. <laughs> you're now that I think about most companies say work hard, play hard, most of those companies are like hard, known for being like hard drinking companies. Yeah, they're toxic companies. Like, you know, Bear Stearns used to play hard. Where are they now? They're gone, you know, so like. <laughs> so, Jeff, one of the things you do for your workshops is um, you, you, you help a company uh, come overcome the current power structures. So the question is, when you do a workshop, what, what if a company does not want the current power structure to be challenged? Yeah, then I'm not the right company for them. <laughs> like, the, like, that's just the reality. There's a lot. So it's funny. There's a lot of organizations that say they want to address issues and then don't address them. The amount of people that I know that do either, you know, DEI work, you know, diversity, inclusion, equity work, or psychological safety work, and they're brought in from a company, and then they're like, hey, these are the things you need to do in order to create a more psychologically safe workspace. And those leaders are like, nah, I don't want to do that. (laughs) It's just like, well, why'd you bring me here? Oh, well, you know, we brought you in here because we do want to address it, but I don't want to do any of those things that you just suggested. Yeah. We just want to so, take your take your picture, put it on our Instagram. Yeah, we just, just want to be performed. Yeah, we just want to, it's a performative, like, especially after, you know, the BLM resurgence back in like 2020, there were a lot of companies that were like, yeah, I'm so interested in this. Yeah, come on in. But then as soon as you told them what they needed to do, they weren't ready to do it, you know? So there's a lot of companies that are not ready. And the thing is, is like, then I can't work with those organizations. I could work with them and just take your money and we could pretend to be doing work. But then that's just not, you know, that's just, that has no integrity. It's no integrity for you or for me. And I think there's a lot of companies that are doing that. They're like, they don't actually really know what sacrifices they need to make in order to create a psychologically safe workspace. Hey, if you're doing DEI work, guess what? You might have to give up some of your power and bring other people to the table in order to really address this work. Are you willing to give up some of that power? And that's the harder conversation to have. So whenever I'm talking to an organization, I need to vet them as much as they're vetting me to be like, okay, what do you actually want to accomplish? all right, let me talk to your leaders and see if they actually are bought in. Um, my, my friend, Trudy LeBron, um, she runs an organization, a DEI organization. If the CEO is not part of the process while they're doing this DEI work, she won't work with the company. She'll just be like, we're not working with them. Because if I don't get buy-in from your CEO, then it won't really matter. I'll do my stuff and then you'll go back to whatever you're doing before. So I want to see the buy-in before I'm willing to do this because I'm, I'm giving you a gift. Like I'm giving you like this work, but I don't want to waste this work when I could be focused on a company that actually wants to do the hard work. So it's all this DEI DI work going on, you know, I mean, you know, the, the stats and especially in tech and stuff like Harbor, right? Yeah. All this DEI work. Is it even even making things better? It just seems like things are staying the same, right? It's like doesn't seem it doesn't like anything's getting better as far as stats wise. I th- I think it depends on the organization. Like Disney's doing some really amazing things, right? But then you got the, like the NFL that's not like it. I think it's at a case by case basis. Um, 
but I think there's a lot of performative DEI work happening, right? Where like a company will hire a DEI staffer or somebody, and then they'll not give them any funding to help. You know, I remember speaking to an organization or speaking to a HR person that was brought in specifically to do DEI work. And the, I think she had a, the staff was like 10,000 people. And I was like, oh, so how many people do you have on staff? And she's like, me, it's just me, <laughs> you know, like, and I have no funding. And it was just like, okay, if you're not putting money behind it, then yeah. So I think we need to be asking ourselves, how much investment are we putting? How much staff do we have in it? How many consultants are we actually bringing in? And then, and then intangibly, what type of progress do we want to see? You know, when I'm running my psychologically safe work um, workshops, I'm contacting them within a week. And then again, within a month to be like, how many more hard conversations are you having? How many more talks about transparency? How many meetings have you actually canceled? Like there's metrics you can actually measure to see what we're doing, you know, and then talking to your, talking to that staff as well and be like, do you feel as if anything has changed? Has that toxic person actually, have they, have they actually started to set boundaries around that toxic person or put that toxic person in a performance improvement plan and, or are they gone? You know, there are metrics we can look at. So uh, Jeff, next, why is it so hard for people to have difficult, difficult conversations? because it's uncomfortable because they have never had them, you know, we, because we've never been trained on having them because we never were taught them in school. You know, think about it. You never had like a debate class. You never, like you had all these other classes, even in college, but you never really were able to like figure out, okay, how do I say my stance without also, you know, offending somebody else while I'm communicating my own boundaries. So we have no training in it. So no wonder we're so bad at it. So I think a lot of times we like beat ourselves up because we're like, well, you know, uh, I can't, I, I, don't, I don't know how to even have that conversation. Or we do something even worse. We're like, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna have this conversation. And you build it up all week and you're like, oh, the conversation's gonna go this way. And then when I say this, they're gonna say this. And you set yourself up for failure because difficult conversations is not one hard conversation. Difficult conversations is constantly putting yourself in a situation where you're expanding your comfort zone and talking about things that aren't easy to talk about. Like, hey, did we break your trust during this pandemic? Hey, are you thinking about leaving? Hey, you know, who, who currently is, you know, the toxic person at work? And do you feel like you're getting bullied at work? And if you can't, or you're not comfortable as a leader talking to your staff about that, then you need some practice. So how, how do, how can we get better at having difficult conversations? Just a matter of like repetition, must memory. So, uh, so that's what a lot of what we do in our, in our workshops, like, especially in our, how to navigate difficult conversations workshop. We, we actually role play it out. We play it out just like, just like practice, right? Just like the NFL, you got to play out the scenarios and you have to be like, okay, how did that feel? All right, let's run it back again. Okay. Let's, if someone says this to you, if someone, you know, says F you to you, how do you respond to that? You know, are they attacking, you know, how do you keep your composure? Like we, you know, we work it out over and over and over again, you know, so that by the time you actually get out there, then you're like, hey, wait a minute, I can actually do this. Hey, wait a minute, when that person's attacking me, they're not actually attacking me. They're just scared. What they're just communicating is they're really scared and they don't know what's going on. You know, and I think that happened a lot, especially early on during the pandemic. A lot of leaders and a lot of staff were snapping at each other because they were freaked out. Like everyone was freaked out. Like I think we forget how rare of a time it was and how scary of a time it was, you know, between March all the way up until like December, you know, and we were just like, oh, what am I going to do? So we would snap at each other and then like, and then not talk about it. So Jeff, next, from my point of view, empathy is a great skill to have. Like as mm -hmm. a leader, everyone needs empathy, but you know, it's like no one has empathy nowadays. No one knows how to deal with empathy. How do we have more people gain empathy? Well, I think you have to understand someone's story. You know, I, I say this a lot of times, if I had a superpower, my superpower would be 
to be able to like have Tupel shake hands, you know, and I would like be able to facilitate that. And they would experience the entire life of the other person. And that's really what empathy is, right? It's this idea of like, let me put myself in your shoes and feel what that's like. Brene Brown talks about how empathy, like sympathy is someone's in a cave and you stick your head down into the cave and you're like, you okay down there? How you doing down there? Oh, you want a sandwich? Like what, what, what's going on? Empathy is you going down in the cave with them, you sitting in the cave with them and being like, you're sad. Okay. I'm going to be sad with you. Oh, you're angry. All right. I'll be here with you. And I'm not here to like judge you. I'm not here to try to fix this. I'm just going to sit next to you during this time. And if leaders could do more of that, if leaders could just listen more to their staff about like, hey, what's going on with, you know, this is what's happening at work right now. And not always trying to fix it, but just trying to understand where their staff is coming from. Like, oh, you know, you know, I'm having a lot of trouble at home. Oh, okay. Well, you know, do you want to talk about it? Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I want to fully talk about it, but like, you know, it's just like stuff is really challenging. All right. You know, how can I support you right now? Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. What if I gave you some, what if I gave you um, Friday off for the next two weeks and I just cover what work you have to do so that you can focus on work at home? Oh, wow. That'd be amazing. You know, like let's start to think about that. Right. And, and I just did a technique of like, of languages of appreciation. Your, your leaders should know what your staff's languages of appreciation are. You know, are they gifts and gifts can be in the, the form of like bonuses. Like I like money. Okay, great. Let's figure out how we can actually take your bonus. A lot of people don't really realize this. You could take a bonus that you give to someone at the end of the year. If you spread out that same bonus throughout the entire year, the same $10,000 bonus or whatever the number you have, and you just give it to them in increments whenever they do something good, higher productivity and more acknowledgement, more recognition. Because at the end of the day, what they want is recognition. They say they want money, but they also want the recognition. So same thing, different way, right? Um, another language of appreciation, acts of service. It's what I just said. Hey, you know, I'm going to cover your, you know, Friday, you take, you take Friday off, or I'm going to cover this. Oh, you're doing, you hate to do this type of work. Let me see if I can find someone else to do this work so you can do your zone of genius work, right? So that's acts of service. Um, words of affirmation. Not only are you giving them recognition and praise to their face, right? And within the department, but you're also giving them praise outside of the department. You're bragging to them, you're bragging about them to other department heads, just in case they want to eventually go to other departments. The fact that you're getting their back on that, the fact that you'd be like, hey, yeah, I'd be more than happy to write you a reference. <clears throat> oh, I know you're like, you know, oh, you're thinking about leaving this job. That's cool. That's fine. You know, let me write you a reference. I've known people that are willing, that have been so willing to um, give them words of affirmation and write reference letters and have their back that that person left, went to another company and then came back because they were so giving about like giving them praise. So that's like another example of it. So we have to be thinking about what are staff's languages of appreciation and how can we give it to them in the way that makes sense to them. And I think it's another way you can tell the difference between a good manager or a bad manager. I think it's something that people in general get wrong, right? So someone's working for you, say, hey, you know, John Bob, the manager, I'm, I'm quitting in two weeks. A lot of times they'll get mad and pissed off, right? Why are you leaving me? You know, yeah. you've done, we've done this stuff for you, blah, blah, blah. You're a Harbor employee. Well, a good man, we're like, oh, you, you, a good man, oh, you're leaving. Where are you going to? Oh, you got a better yeah. job, you know? Oh, because like, the bad man just thinks they're de de being this Lord leaving. But you should take the point of view, like, hey, this person, they owned a better job because of your training, because what you did, yeah, what they learned the skills. You, ce you celebrate it, right? You celebrate the fact that they're moving on. Like, oh, that's awesome. Because when they move to a different company, you're going to have like an ambassador for you and your company for the rest of your life, right? Versus being pissed off and petty and, you know, oh, why are you leaving for? You exactly. Know, you're fired right now. I'll leave, you know, I just think so many people get that wrong. Yeah. And, and good leaders also don't make it about them. Like if you think about all the toxic leaders, it's all about them. Right. And a good leader all constantly is putting their staff first. You know, um, I talk a lot about 
uh, Dan Price from Gravity Payments, right? Yeah. Dan Price, you know, set a minimum wage at his company of seventy thousand dollars a year and everyone said like, his company everyone said his company will fail but they're like they're booming even after the yeah COVID, back like in booming. 2015 he did this and all these all these ceos were like that's dumb like you are going to be out of business within a year and then they were thriving right and then people are like oh whatever then the pandemic hit and all of his staff were willing to take pay cuts they were taking pay cuts between 20 and 40%. Not one stat. They didn't have to lay off one staff member yeah. during the pandemic because they were willing to pay, take pay cuts. Why were they willing to take pay cuts? Because he had went above and beyond for them. And now they were reciprocating that back to him. That's what we need to be seeing more of that. It's like, let me get your back. So you'll get my back. And I think a lot of leaders right now that are narcissistic, right? Like, uh, what was it? This psychologist basically recently said, if you want me to study narcissism, point me to the top 20 CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. There you go. That's your narcissism. As long as we're celebrating that type of leadership, you know, we're not going to be creating spaces where people want to go back to work. And with Dan Price, even if you don't agree what he did or his background with diversity, you cannot ignore the best results. I mean, you just can't. Yeah, exactly. You cannot ignore the best results of what he did. And, and the I, same thing with same thing with Tony Shea at Zappos, you know, before Tony Shea passed away, initially at Zappos, he would pay people three grand to leave, to leave the company, be like, hey, I'll give you three grand if you don't enjoy being here, because like we just want people that actually want to be weird and strange. And, you know, this might not be the right environment for everyone, but like we want anyone to show up however they want to show up. And people that took the money weren't the right people for the job. And the people that stayed loved staying there. So I know Dan you Price put your money where your mouth is. I know Dan Price did a LinkedIn post a while ago where he broke down like the, the effects of seventy thousand dollars, like how many people were really bought by first homes, how many babies were born, yep, how much money was put in the economy, all all the second and third effects of that decision you made. It, it is a great thing. So next, um, back to the great, great resignation. So I think one thing people are getting wrong about this, of course, there's pros and negatives to everything. Negative is people creating jobs, companies are, are lurch. Mm -hmm. But according to the, to the SBA and U.S. Census, Census Bureau, there's been more small business started this time from any other time in the history yeah. of the U.S., right? And on top of that, I think I, I could be getting this number wrong, but 75% of those companies that are starting are starting like higher paying jobs. So this one person might quit their job at, you know, Amazon or whatever the, what the case would be, XYZ company, but starting, you know, ABC Towing Company and they're employing 10, going to employ 10 people. So you took a well, loss of one job, but you're gaining 10 jobs in the economy. And I think a lot yeah. of people are missing that. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. And also a lot of people are starting small businesses because they're like, I don't want to work for somebody anymore, right? <laughs> like I hated my last four bosses. So why don't I be my own boss? I know someone did a LinkedIn post a couple of days ago. They, uh, they worked in a large company and they took this idea to the man, to the boss. Oh, that's something to go to the next boss. I mean, so Three managers was up. They all said a great idea, but then like two months later, no, no one said anything. No one did anything. Like so, he decided, you know what? I'm tired of being blown off. No one taking my input. Mm -hmm. I've had several ideas. At least tell me something, right? Tell me it doesn't work. Whatever. Just that's oh, great idea, and go back to work. So what he did, he quit and started a company doing this idea, and he like sold it like twenty million dollars a couple like a couple of weeks ago, right? And so I, I put on the post like I wonder what percentage of people start quit their job and start a company because of managers like this. Well, what's interesting is I'm look, I got to look up what his name is, but the CEO of Zoom, Eric Wan, was yeah. working on Microsoft's meetings. I, I remember that. He yeah. was working on a virtual platform for them and he was trying to explain his idea to them because there's something like magical about Zoom where yeah, I, I remember that like, story. Just that, you know, just looking at the screen and like, Am I talking directly to you? Like, can you see me? Like, are we vibing? He was able to figure that out. And he was trying to figure that out with Microsoft and they didn't want to hear it. Yeah. So he was just like, okay, I'll just make my own small company. And now who's using, how many people are using Zoom and how many people are using Microsoft meetings? I and mean, how many people complain about Microsoft I mean, meetings? Microsoft Teams, Dude, WebEx, horrible. all the other ones, you know, like. Yeah, all those, man. Go to meeting, like all of them. And Eric tried to give them the idea and they didn't want it. 
It's unbelievable. And this is another example of like leaders not listening to their staff, you know, and not creating a safe space. Like they did a study a while back that found that many top executives, I think it was 70 or 80% of top executives will not share their favorite, their best ideas with their leader because they don't want them to steal it. So right now, if you think about a lot of Fortune 500 companies or just products that we have, we have the mediocre version of so many products because people aren't willing to share their best ideas. I know, it's, 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 it's crazy. So next, let's talk about public speaking. Um, um, talk about the points of regardless what you, what you do in life or you're you know, um, a CEO, um, fast food worker, high school student, whatever the case would be, talk about the points of learning public speaking as a skill and getting better at public speaking. Yeah, so I think what um, is important about public speaking is just like, well, why do you want to be a speaker? What are you trying to do? I, I saw Kam- uh, Kamala Harris giving advice to like this 13 year old girl about how to speak in public because she's like, I'm so scared, I'm so nervous. And Kamala basically said to her, he was, she was like, it's not about you. You're channeling a message. Like you, you have a message that happens to be coming through you, but it's the, this is, but even though you're up on stage and people are looking at you, the message is more important than you. <clears throat> and I think phenomenal public speakers understand that. They understand that, that they're constantly trying to attune with um, the crowd or attune with uh, people. Like you can feel it in the room. Um, I'm about to do this presentation that I mentioned to you for like Highline College about leadership. And I was going to bring up MLK and how um, during his I Have a Dream speech, he actually changed the last 16 minutes. Yeah, a lot of people don't know he, that. A lot of people don't know that. He just like went off the cuff and started attuning with the crowd and feeling what the crowd was, you know, vibing off of and hearing that and responding to it. And, and it was like this call and response type experience for him, you know, um, and he was just channeling, channeling that inner genius, right? Channeling, you know, that creative muse. And when you're doing that, like, then you're like, oh, this is so much more important. This is bigger than me. Right. Because I'm not going to be around for forever, but what can I do at this moment to cause a ripple effect? So whenever I'm about to go into like a a talk, which I'm about to go into one, you know, in a couple hours, I'm constantly saying to myself. How can you have an impact? You're you know, how do you make the biggest impact? Remember, this is not about you. This is about impacting people's lives and and showing up. So remember, this is not about you. This is about them. How do you make it all about? causing a ripple effect for them. So then they walk away and then they can take that information and become better leaders. And I think that skill set, if you have that skill set, then you can actually be a servant leader like a lot of you know what Southwest talks about. So back to leaders or, or no quote unquote people who think they're leaders in a company. I think a lot of you know so-called leaders they get this thing where I'm this position. So I know better than anyone in my organization or in my staff, yeah. right? And I think so many companies are going to get destroyed from that, that kind of thinking. Yeah, I think, I think when you haven't been in the trenches for a really long time, and that's what I would tell leaders also to do, when was the last time you were in the trenches? When was the last time you did the job of, um, you know, when did you last time do you do, do the job of the lowest paid worker at your company? You know, there's a, there's, um, you know, what is it? Undercover boss. And I, I want to propose a show called Boss Swap, where the boss, the CEO has to swap roles with the lowest paying person in the company for like three to six months, maybe even a year. Because it, can you imagine if you swap Jeff Bezos's current job to um, the warehouse worker that does the midnight shift, which my nephew used to do is a rough shift from like 11 p.m. to like 6 a.m. And he had to do that for three to six months and live off of the money of that. Like Bezos would totally change 
how he treats his employees. And I think a lot of bosses need to do that. A lot of leaders need to understand what it's like to be in the trenches. And when you have a, you have a lot right now, you have a lot of leaders that are so removed and then they have these meetings to talk about what staff need to do. And they have no idea what that job is. They have no idea what, you know, and they're making decisions that are gonna affect thousands of people's of lives and they haven't even been there, right? Like you see that in schooling when you have a lot of administrators and principals being like, this is what we should do for teachers. And you're like, when was the last time you taught in a school? Oh, I've never even taught in a school. Why are you giving advice then to teachers on how to teach in their school? Like, yeah, it just, it's mind blowing to me. I remember a while ago when the delivery companies, like DoorDash or one of those type of companies, I can't remember which one, they came with a policy where everyone in the company had to deliver food for one day, right? And it was door, these, DoorDash. DoorDash. DoorDash did last month, and all these people came out, and especially the software developer, like, "I'm not doing that. That's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Yeah, making hundreds of thousand dollars off these people delivering food is not too dangerous for them. You can't do it for a day. I remember, yep. I remember there being this big backlash against that. It was such. It was just a month ago, and it was one day. It wasn't even one day. It was like one or two deliveries. Yeah, just do one or two deliveries, just so you know how it feels. Especially because you're doing like the back end and the data and the like. You need to understand the do app. The, do, the, do, the user, do the user research. Right? Yeah, it's dual user research. Like it just makes sense, and people freaked out. Dude. It was crazy. It was like, was like you get paid people are trying to quit you know, that's ridiculous yeah you get paid one hundred fifty thousand to two hundred thousand dollars you can't go to starbucks grab a coffee and walk a mile and drop off that coffee to somebody else you can't do that and i want people to oh Come I, on. it's not safe i get mugged i bet crime or whatever blah, blah blah but you want these other people to do it what do you want these other people to do it right like you're, you're okay day. okay i see how this goes i see how this is like so that's only a month ago it's like so long ago no, that wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it was like a month, two months ago, or at least that's when it got in the news that I saw. I wonder if they if they actually did that or they backed off because of all the complaints from the software developers. Yeah, so hopefully they did I, it. See, see, a good leader would have, have been like, yes, this is a perfect way of building empathy. Mm -hmm. Like a good leader would have been like, no, we're doing it. And if you want to quit, this is not the right company for you. Well, hopefully, you hopefully, hopefully the CEO went out and had the film crew, like the social media crew film them doing it, you know, like, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm doing it. I mean, not when you're doing it, I'm going to the, the worst crime-ridden neighborhood in the whole state to deliver this, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> like how many people at the administrative offices of McDonald's have never worked one shift at a store and they're making decisions that affect like hundreds of thousands of people on a whim? Like, you know, like, hey, we you can actually turn around fast food time i want you to get the food to like the people at the drive through in less than 90 seconds mm -hmm. wait have you ever have you ever, ever tried that like do you know how hard that is like come on man <laughs> first of all the customer will be talking to me for 90 seconds right yeah exactly I'm gonna tell the customer. but i see that clock that's running and they literally are measuring them based off that clock it's like it's just so inhumane you know and we really have to be looking at like you know going forward does this actually make sense from a humanistic standpoint? So, Jeff, kind of off topic, tell us the background on your bow ties. Because every time I see you, you always uh, have a bow tie on. Bow ties. What's the background of the bow ties? So the background of the bow tie, so I'm wearing this Lego bow tie for anyone that's just like listening. The background of the bow tie is, so I used to work for this organization, uh, Playwell. Um, it was a Lego-inspired STEM organization. Uh, and we, you know, we built it from like seven people to like 400 people. And the whole time we would just play, like we had no business plan. We just made up stuff as we went along. We failed miserably, you know, but we just kept going. And then we would, and it grew, we would fail and then we would try out and we keep changing. So, um, you know, one time I was about to go to a conference and my my former colleague, Lisa, uh, we had just made these bow ties that we had just like someone had fooled around with them and made some. And she was just like, I dare you to wear this to a conference. And I was like, Ooh, I love a dare. I was like, I'll wear it. You know? So I wore it to the conference and the conference was so much better. Like I attracted all these nerdy people. People wanted to talk to me about star Wars and karate kid and, you know, Lego and just like, 
And what was interesting was by wearing this, I all without even realizing I was giving permission for people to play or hang out with me. And then I, and then I was like, well, why don't I just wear this other places? So I'd wear it to the airport. You know, I'd wear it to like restaurants, same experience. Like we'd be like, oh my gosh, I, I want to talk to you about, you know, and I was just like, oh, this is so much more fun. And I figured like, listen, when we go to work, everyone's wearing a costume. Like everybody has their, like they have their tie, they have their pants suit on. And it's just like, well, why don't I wear, like, I'm going to wear my costume as well. But like my costume is going to mock the idea of us all wearing these costumes. So, you know, I say this a lot as well of like, you know, well, why don't we play more at work? You're already playing at work already. You're playing a role that you think people want you to play. Why don't you play a role that you want to play, right? Why don't you show up as who you, you are more so? So wearing the bow tie was almost like in protest to like dressing up. And it also just reminded me not to take myself so seriously. So Jeff, let's go back to resumes for a minute. So a lot of people in the job search, they'll be told, you know, don't, don't send your same resume to like 10 different companies, tell your resume each part. Mm -hmm. But is that really good advice? I mean, cause like if you're telling your, of course you're not going to lie, put anything false your resume, but you're telling your resume to each company are you really putting your authentic stuff out there? So anybody have one base resume, hey, this is what I do, this is what I wanna do, here's my true self, and then send it comes like that. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I've seen some really horrible resumes and I've seen some really fascinating, phenomenal resumes, you know, and I feel like there is a certain value to adapting it slightly, especially if the job is drastically different. You know, if you're trying to like, you know, if you're like in sales and you want to communicate how much you've sold in the past, then that's how it should be reflected, right? If you're talking about, you know, recruiting, how many people have you recruited? Like, what is your, you know, what's your, like, what's the turnover rate at your organization? What was the turnover rate when you first arrived? And were you able to change that? Like, I think there's value in doing that. But I think something that's actually more important than any of that is like, how is your resume communicating who you are in a unique way? And this might not just be your resume or your cover letter, but I'm constantly telling people like, in addition to like applying the standard way where you submit your resume and cover letter, what other unique things are you doing to get the attention of an organization? You know, send a DM to Instagram, you know? Yeah, like, comment on like yeah, you know, or... so yes, yeah, make a video that goes with your resume, right? Yeah. Um, send a loom or send a video response via LinkedIn just to connect with the department people and just be like, hey, I just applied for this job. This is why I really love your organization. This is what I really appreciate. These are my skill sets. You know, you already have my resume, but I just wanted to like introduce myself, you know, publicly so that you could see who I am. Like, let's start being creative, right? Let's start reaching out to people and and talking to them way before you actually apply for a job hey you know sending a linkedin message and being like i just love the work that you do at your organization i yeah. love specifically your department i would be fascinated to find out you know what are the skill sets you need to work for your department um if you have any time i'd love to connect with you if not totally understand you send out a bunch of those you send it out to like 10 different people at 10 different organizations or heck 20 different people at 10 different organizations. So you look up different people at different departments at companies that you want to work for. Someone's eventually going to get back to you, especially if you're giving them praise. And, you know, I'm working with this guy, Blake uh, Fly right now, who who's having us to send thank yous to people, people that we used to work with or people that we have like a good relationship with and be just like, hey, you know, like I really appreciated being on your podcast. Hey, I really appreciated doing that project with you, you know, as a way of like reconnecting with people. And again, just showing up with a certain level of shared humanity. And that is how you get moved up on the resume list. If you're just sending out so many resumes and maybe some cover letters, and just hoping, I don't think you're going to be that successful. At this point, you have to be creative. You have to come up with a brand new way of doing it. I remember right after 9-11, I was in New York and like jobs were, were scarce. This guy showed up wearing his resume 
he had a placard resume that back and front and he just stood outside the companies that he wanted to get hired by that's genius. guess what he got hired <laughs> like, that's that's freaking genius there was a guy that wanted to work for um it wasn't stevie wonder but um uh something jones i forgot what the last name this guy called their office every day specifically at 8 a.m every day for a whole month and then finally got an um finally got attention so you don't have to do those things but think of what creative way that makes sense to you that you'd want to do i know a while ago of course i have no concept of time anymore it might have been two weeks ago it might be a month someone did a poll on uh, linkedin and said basically said hey my daughter wants to know if she sort of put a picture on her resume and like i think it had like ten thousand like votes like 80 percent said no no picture nothing creative traditional like a resume and i, I put a comment are we still in the 1980s like she should like put out whatever she's comfortable with right it has to be based on her job comfortable with. what's she comfortable yeah. with in the world right but so many people like and i call them the old hr not based on age but based on mindset oh no black and white resume 12 font blah 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 yep. you're not gonna get a job being creative you know i'm like are you kidding me right like this is not 1980 like come on now yeah if you're if you're applying to a creative job then show creativity in the resume right <clears throat> Yeah, I know if you're like trying to be an accountant or maybe a banker, yeah, I get it, right? Traditional, traditional resume, I get it. Um, so next, I found let's talk about TikTok. It seemed like you had a lot of fun on there. That's how I found you on TikTok. You make a lot yeah. of great videos. Why are you TikTok? What do you get out of it? What's the purpose of being TikTok? So I started making them because, like, I just wanted to see if I could do something that scares me. So like March 2020 rolled around and up until that point, I had not made many videos and I was scared to like make videos and like look at myself in a video. It's like, I hated how I sounded. I hated how I looked. And I was just like, oh gosh, like it's just I'm weird. Um, and, you know, and then all of a sudden I was like, and also, and I would use the excuse, I don't have time. And then March 2020 rolls around. I was like, guess what? You have all the time in the world. And you know what I did with that time? I binge watched Netflix. I, I went on social media. I like did all these things, but I didn't make videos. I just avoided it for a whole month. But then after doing all the things, right? Watching Tiger King and, you know, like, you know, trying to do hobbies and whatever. Then I was like, let me just make one TikTok video for myself. Just, just no one's going to watch it, but I'm going to make it because I want to make it. And then I just started making these videos as a way of coping during the pandemic and processing things, right? Like just processing my thoughts. And it's only like 30 seconds or a minute. So it's like, it's not that hard. And by doing it, I got really comfortable with cutting video. And that gave me the bravery to then start hopping on podcasts because I was like, now, hey, this is not that hard. I love to talk about my work. And then by the end of the year, I, by the end of 2020, I had been on over a hundred podcasts and I had made like over 400 TikTok videos. And, it, and at the, at the beginning I was like freaked out. I was like so scared to do it. So a lot of it was just seeing like, how do I, how do I do something that scares me every day or do something that at least pushes me outside of my comfort zone. And then by doing that, I create, i I found a community you know, and I started talking about my work and psychological safety and stuff like that. And people start following you um, on that platform because it's the TikTok. TikTok is such a fascinating platform because you can stitch videos, meaning you can like take someone's video and add on to your video. You can duet videos where they're doing the video and you do it right next to them. There's so many ways you can play with other people's content. You can even like like copy the their voice and then redo their voice, but you you're lip syncing their voice, right? That and and there's now over people on TikTok that it's like a world where you find people resonate with you. So it's just so interesting. So it's such like an interesting platform, and it's also where I got a ton of my information now. You know, where like you would, you typically would not be able to find information on like Vashal Garg, you know, when he got laid, where did that start? That started on TikTok, right? Yeah. And the analysis around that. So 
this is it's a really interesting platform that both activism and workers can learn a lot from. Yeah, I'm a big fan of TikTok. Just the, like the people I follow, the people stuff. Because people, are, oh, it's just like crap. Don't get me wrong, this crap on this like any other social media platform. But people putting out great content or the, the stuff you can learn. You know, like I follow this one lady. She's like a, some kind of scientist. She lives in, by the North Pole. She talked about her daily uh -huh. thing in the North Pole. I follow a psychiatrist. She's like 75 years old. Gave gives men, daily advice on mental health. There's so many people out there doing great things on TikTok. I'm, I'm very bullish on TikTok. Yeah. The other thing that a lot of people forget is the great resignation. Some of that was moved by TikTok mm -hmm. because you they people were showing themselves literally quitting the job at that moment, like getting on the intercom at Walmart and being like, hey, Jared, I quit. Yeah. And then walking off or or filming at the Amazon warehouse and being like, this is my last day. I'm leaving right after this, you know, or like um, a bunch of people at Burger King, they all left and the whole Burger King store had to shut down. I, I, I remember that. that on, I remember they filmed that. that on TikTok. Dude. I remember that. Yeah. So like so much movements are happening. The whole anti-work movement right now, people that are like, I just don't want to work at all. A lot of that discussion is happening on Reddit and it's happening on TikTok. And good thing about TikTok, you can still get views on TikTok, right? No matter who you are, right? I mean, in order to get like views or, or any kind of traction like Facebook, Instagram, you got to be McDonald's, Conair West, you know, somebody yep. famous. Like you can be anyone on TikTok and, 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 you know, quote unquote blow up and get a lot of views, right? It's still like a wild, wild west, so to speak. Yeah, it still is. And and it's interesting because if you simply are saying something that and you're going, you're being really brave and being like, hey, I want to share this really important thing. It resonates with a lot of people. You know, I, I think with TikTok, there's no like no rhyme or reason. Like you might make a video at two in the afternoon, get two views, make another view at 6 p.m. You get 2000 views. Right. I think there's no set thing. Like you just got to push stuff out there. You can't you say, just hey, put it out there. You can't say every day I'm doing a video at 3 p.m. Well, one day might have two views, but next day might have 2,000 views. You just, you just don't yeah. know. And here's the other ironic part about TikTok. Sometimes you don't want to go viral. Like I've had videos that have gone viral and like half a million people watch it or a million people. And it's not the video I want people to see. Like, yeah. It's just like, it's just, it's just a dumb video that I made that's like, takes like 10 seconds. So a lot of times it's, it's not, again, it's not about like becoming popular on there. It's about sharing your voice and your ideas. And it's just a great platform for me where I can share stuff that matters to me. And then what's cool is I make it on TikTok. I cut the video. Yes. Then I move it over to Instagram. Exactly. And then I move it over to LinkedIn. And then I exactly. move it over to Twitter. And then I eventually move it over to YouTube. So so I'm it's, cutting all my videos on TikTok, but I'm putting it on these all these different platforms. TikTok is so, the user experience on there is like fantastic, outstanding. It's just so easy. Yeah. And, and to me, TikTok is what Snapchat should have been from our point of view. Oh, what, what, so what TikTok should have been? Is, Snapchat should have been TikTok. You know, Snapchat exactly. started out yep. and then it got clunky and stuff. Like yep. to my mind, I, I saw Snapchat being TikTok, but Snapchat went another direction, I guess. And TikTok did whatever, you know, but yeah. And also think what, how TikTok got so popular during the pandemic, right? Yeah. It was when you first, when I first hopped on, yes, it was just teenagers dancing and you'd be like, this is really stupid. But then if you could get away from that and you started following people that you, like I follow a lot of people that are talking about work and talking about toxicity at work and talking about how we need to reinvent work. When you like are following a bunch of people like that, you leave that platform quite educated about a lot of issues that you otherwise would never know. Like I've learned more on TikTok about certain parts of history. Oh, easily. That, that, that I didn't learn in college. Easily, easily. In high school. So it's funny when, you know, people are trying to ban books, you know, and you're just like, you, you're not allowed to read this book. And you're like, do you know how your kids get information now? They don't Nothing. get it from books. They're getting nope. it from TikTok, some, you some know, random, and all these other Some random stranger, you know, who knows where this random stranger is, you know. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, are you still good on time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm still good. Okay, good. We'll make sure. So next, and you talked about this some already, but talk about the importance of putting your, your authentic self out there to the world. Um, um, I don't know. There's the term authenticity has been like run through the ringer 
you know, <laughs> like you have to be authentic. You got to embrace your authenticity. And it's kind of like lost its, its uh, luster. Um, and, but, you know, the, the idea or the definition of it is, you know, being your unapologetic self. It's showing up even if it's not popular. It's saying the thing even if it's not popular. It's saying the thing because you want to say it and because you believe it. You know, it's following your convictions, right? You know, it's speaking up at a meeting. It's quitting a job if you don't want to do it. It's standing up for someone that's getting bullied. Like, that's what I see when I think of, like, authenticity. It's um, not regretting um, not showing up, right? And that can show up in a lot of different forms. That doesn't have to be you speaking up at work. That ha that can be you like how you show up in your writing, how you show up in videos, like how are you basically interacting with the world? And I think a lot of times we are constantly trying to be normal or trying to not, not uh, rock the boat. And by pursuing this boring normal, no one can get to know anyone because everyone's pretending to be normal when everyone is super weird. <laughs> so uh, you talk about TikTok, how TikTok encouraged you to go on podcasts. And so if I do my research right, you were on 100 podcasts in 2020, same yeah. time in 2021. What's your advice to people to get on, on podcasts? How do you get on so many podcasts? What's the process yes. for that? So there's so, I mean, I wrote a whole article about it, so I can send you the article. But first off, you have to like identify, like, why do you want to be on a like, what's, what's your purpose? Like, what are you trying to do? Is there a certain message? Again, just like speaking, you know, is the message more important to you? If you just want to get on podcasts and talk and hear yourself talk, you know, there's 800,000 podcasts currently. I mean, that is an, that's actually an accurate number. 800,000 live podcasts, actually 2.1 million podcasts existed at one point but many of them fell off, but there's still around 800,000 around. So you'll find someone that just wants to listen to you talk. Um, but is that what you want to, want to do? Like, what is the actual message? So I think that's the most important thing first, identify what message you want to give and then be like, okay, well then what platforms do I want to be on? Like, who am, and I talk about work. So obviously I want to be on HR platforms. I want to talk about people that are constantly in the a workspace. Other people want to talk about creativity and writing, then, you know, reach out to all the writing, the writing podcasts. Um, and then there's so many avenues to do this. There are all these platforms that you don't even have to pay. You just like sign up and, and they suggest certain podcasts that you could apply to. The, those exist like Matchmaker and Pod podcast guest and a bunch of ones like that but then also there are a lot of facebook groups where it's just like you you know you people are writing like i'm looking for these type of speakers i just sent my friend sarah like 10 10 places where they have applications where you just fill out the application and you just apply to fill it out so that's i think another part um and then and then also you know don't be so you know like identify what podcasts you like. And if you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready to be on a podcast like that, then find ones that are similar and just start applying. And then the other part that's actually really important, and I write this in the article, is when you actually reach out to a podcaster, listen to their podcast. <laughs> like that is like so actually key. like listen to some of it. You don't have to listen to all of it, but at least get an idea of what it is and I like to actually reference when I send an email to someone be like, hey, I listened to this part, this podcast from way back when you first started. This is what really resonated with me. Um, so I just appreciative sort of this. This kind of lines up with the type of work that I do. I talk about this type of work is, you know, am I the right fit? Here is, here is, you know, a bunch of the podcasts that I've gone on. I actually have a podcast page that I send people to. You know, like these are all the podcasts, these are all the, you know, these are the topics that I talk about, you know, so people could easily just copy and paste stuff if they need it. Um, and then I, and then I end the email with like, hey, if I'm not the right fit, like total, you don't have to respond to me. Like, you know, I still respect and really enjoy your podcast. And then I move on and I apply to another one. You know, I remember in order to get on a hundred podcasts or a hundred plus podcasts my first year, I probably applied to like 328 podcasts 
to get on like 130. So that's like 33% return. So that makes sense. Like, okay, like that makes sense. So if you do that, you're going to get on some podcasts. So that you would have a good point um, I want to follow up on. You talk about the points of whether you're an entrepreneur in sales, looking for a job, the points of getting, getting comfortable hearing the word no more often than yeah. not. I think so many people hear a no, they take a personal, oh, yep. they said no, what am I going to do? But I mean, basically, you just admit a like, failing 67% of the time, right? But yep. that 30% success rate is what is making you, right? Can you talk about the points yeah. of getting comfortable hearing no? And 30% is high. It's very because, high, yeah. Yeah, when I am sending out like, you know, cold emails or trying to build up like, you know, new work, if I email a hundred people, if three people get back to me, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is huge. That's 3%, you know? So I think we have to get, and this is, this ties back into difficult conversation. We have to get uncomfortable being uncomfortable, like, and realize it's not about you. Most of the time, it's not about you. And if you realize that, then you wouldn't internalize so much stuff. Exactly. So next, uh, you, you did a Medium article a while ago, maybe it was recently. Yeah. And the basis was, a question was, how can it get editing better than this? Can you talk oh, about yeah. that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so I studied, you know, positive psychology, got like, you know, you know, certified in it. And um, we talked a lot about framing. Like, how do you frame your day? And uh, my um, friend, Eric Bailey, would uh, talk about how, like, when you want to buy a yellow car, you'll see a yellow car everywhere. Like, you'll just see it everywhere. Like, it's just, yeah. it's, like, happens it's just, every, happens everyone. it's just pattern recognition, right? So, okay, well, then let's play with pattern recognition for a second. So my friend Desiree taught me this really interesting question that she would ask herself at the beginning of the day and throughout the day. And she would ask herself, how can it get any better than this? And she would ask herself that when she's having a bad day, she would ask herself when she's having a good day, but she would ask her like, ooh, with curiosity, how can it get any better than this? Not with expectations, because expectations are the thief of joy, but just be the curiosity, like, ooh, how can it get any better than this? And then things would actually get better, right? So like, you know, perfect example this morning for me, like, you know, I woke up and was excited about the day. And I was just like, oh, how can it get any better than this? Oh, I got like my favorite sandwich. How can it get any better than this? Now we're having this conversation. Oh, how can it get any better than this? I'm doing this presentation afterwards. How can it get any better than this? You know, I'm going to get to see a friend tonight and hang out with them. So like when you are constantly priming yourself to look for positive patterns, you will see positive patterns. Now, when someone says I have, I had a bad day, I challenge them because I'm like, I don't think you had a bad day. What you had was you had a bad moment. And, um, you know, a lot of psychology studies find that, you know, you experience an emotion between 60 to 90 seconds, and then you can let go of that emotion. You can move on. But a lot of people have a bad moment and then they the loop happens and then they continue to ruminate about that bad moment. And then they look for another bad moment and another bad moment. And then it culminates in a bad day, right? Like some people say, oh, bad things happen in threes. Well, now that you've said that, you've primed your brain to look for three bad things to happen. So why not ask yourself instead the question of how can it get any better than this and see how your like entire day can change or frankly, your entire life. So Jeff, back to the workplace and having fun at work. So, you know, the workplace, you have introverts, extroverts, all these mm -hmm. different Meyer Briggs scale people. Talk about the challenge of being a manager and, and working through all these people and make sure all these people get what they need from the workplace. Yeah, well, this ties back into like the languages of appreciation, right? And, and also how do you communicate? You know, if you know a lot of like extroverts, they want platforms where they can be extroverted right they want to be able to talk a lot they they want they may want you to sit down with you a lot and like have zoom meetings right while an introvert's like i'm good i don't need to see you for a whole week or maybe like a few weeks so but as long so you have to be talking to your staff about what is the best way in which i can support you i think a lot of introverts thrived during the pandemic right and that's a great thing that that they, you know, found, I found out I'm an, I, I am definitely an extrovert, but I am an 
introverted extrovert. I was happy also being at home. As long as I could connect people via Zoom, I was like, I'm good. But like, so there's like nuances to each and every one, like even not even throwing everyone like, okay, this person's an introvert or this person's an extrovert, but really understanding the nuances of how that person works and how that person shows up. Hey, um, do you like doing presentations? No, I hate to present. But I, you know, okay, but can you help with this presentation? Yeah, I love it. I'll, I'll put together the numbers. I'll do all the stuff on the back end. Awesome. Then that's what we're going to do. But if you're going to be like, no, you need to learn public speaking because it's really important. Is it though? Like maybe that's not that person's skill set and that's not the career path they want to go on. So then don't force them to do that. Really constantly be asking them, how do you want to develop as um a staff member, how, how, what, what skills do you want to develop in the next year, right? You know, where do you want to be at in a year and how can I help you personally to get there? When you're having those conversations, all of a sudden, then people start to be able to connect you better, regardless of whether they're extroverted or introverted. You might laugh at this, but when I, up here in Seattle, we're locked down, you know, court or whatever. Like I'm an introvert, introvert, but I also have like no people but I feel like, I'm like, damn, I need, I need to see someone in person, right? This is, this is driving me crazy. I can't see my wife every day. I got to see someone besides my wife and kids mm -hmm. pretty soon, or I'm going to go batshit crazy, right? Mm hmm Yeah, yeah. So, Jeff, <laughs> next, next, talk about your entrepreneurial journey. Like, you from corporate to have every own company. Talk about that journey, your thought process, why you decided to go on your own, so to speak. Yeah, so, you know, the bat, I mean, it's interesting, I'm telling this now, because we usually lead with this, but the Batman origin story is, I saw, I saw big when I was a kid, and uh, um, Tom Hanks was playing with toys for a living, and I was like, that's a job, and I was like, oh my goodness, I need that job, so um, I started writing toy companies in third grade, and I just did not stop, um, until they hired me, you know, like 15 years later, and I don't know if you've ever gotten exactly what you've always wanted and then been so disappointed when you get there. <laughs> but um, there was no toys, no fun, no high fives, no kids. And I was like, man, this job sucks, <laughs> you know. Um, and I remember leaving that and having my quarter life crisis. And I was in New York at the time. Uh, and I came to the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area. I found this job on Craigslist where they were teaching kids engineering with Lego. They were playing with Lego for a living. And I was like, oh, dude, like, I want to do this. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, then we took it from like seven people to 400 people. And the whole time we just were playing, no business plan, picked cities we thought were fun, picked people we thought were fun, you know, made a ton of mistakes, but just kept growing because we were nerding out. We were just doing, and this is when STEM wasn't even a thing. Like we were doing it in 2004 when a lot of people didn't even know what the acronym of STEM was. And then we got so large and then I left to do some campaign work and I came back um, and then I was just like, well, you know, I want to do like Lego with adults. So I started just reaching out to companies and companies actually started reaching out to us first. And they were like, hey, do you do team building events and special events? And we're like, yeah, of course we do. No, we didn't. We didn't do any of that. But we just said yes to everything because we're like, yeah, we'll figure it out. And we just figured it out. And then I ended up running for a decade special events and team building events for like the top tech companies like in the world. And while I was doing this, I found that even at these companies that constantly got best places to work awards, I realized there wasn't even that much psychological safety there. You know, people were not taking risks. People were not having difficult conversations. People were not doing what the company says that they're doing, the, all the things on the wall of like, you know, take risks, be creative, do, be you, you know? And I was like, that's actually not true. This is not happening at this company. So I created Rediscover Your Play back in like 2019 to start tackling those issues of like, how do we have those hard conversations? How do we address that toxic person at work? How do we get your staff in flow? How do we navigate this great resignation? How do we deal with toxic masculinity in the workplace? But we do it through the perspective of play and positive psychology. So what's, what, what's your focus on right now for the company? Um, 
I think a focus right now is I'm doing a lot of workshops right now around like, you know, great resignation, uh, around like I'm about to do a talk around toxic masculinity at work, um, because I really want to talk about how we address the future of work and what type of leaders do we want to support going forward. Because as I mentioned earlier, we've celebrated for so long the Steve Jobs, the Elon Musks, the Jeff Bezos, the Wolf of Wall Street guy, these people that do not put employees first. And I'm hoping the future of work is different where we are actually celebrating staff and people that actually really know how to lead from a place of empathy and compassion. So Jeff, what's your vision for the future of your company? Is it like keep on doing the work by yourself? Or do you envision have having kind of like a John Maxwell franchise program where a bunch of people walking into you and spread your message? No, definitely not franchise. I mean, I always say I I want to talk, I believe, you know, one of my biggest theories is I believe play can heal the world, right? Um, and I'm starting with the workplace. How can play heal the workplace? So I would love to speak at Davos about how play can heal the workplace or play can heal the world. I, I want to be speaking a lot about this. So I want to be on bigger and, and larger stages addressing how we bring compassionate um, empathy and compassionate play back to work. Um, also, I want to talk more about um, leadership where we are able to balance feminine and masculine leadership for so such a long period of time we've only celebrated masculine leadership which is like analytical and decisive and and competitive and there is some divine feminine leadership that actually is really important that leaders need to have which is collaborative which is play which is intuitive which is like compassion and empathy and you need to find the balance between both not one is better than the other but when you find the balance a leader that has those components is one of the strongest leaders and i always ref refer to new zealand prime minister jacinda ardern who actually balanced both feminine and masculine leadership was decisive was analytical was also compassionate empathetic and collaborative um and look she had the lowest COVID rates in the world. Her, her constituents were willing to follow a lot of the things to do the lockdown at the beginning. And because of that, everyone is safe. And that's what happens when you can show up with both feminine and masculine leadership. So Jeff, from your point of view or from your opinion, do people learn more from bad leaders or they learn more from good leaders? I think they learn more from good leaders, because as I was talking to a, a friend of mine, Maddie uh, Gabor, when you're miserable, you can't, your brain actually is not able to function well, because you're in a constant state of fear and flight, and you don't feel safe, so you can barely focus. Like, you might learn from that bad leader after the fact, but like, there's no growth during because you're just worried all the time. You're constantly having to put out fires of your bad boss or your disorganized boss, you know, trying to trying to like figure out what in the world they're doing that you never can develop your own, you know, you never have time for your own personal development. And when you have a good leader, you have time to work and develop at the same time. You know, I think the only thing a lot of times you learn from a bad leader is what not to do, you know, but that doesn't help you with what, how you can grow as an individual as much. Yeah. And you, and it's just also like, why would you want to learn from a bad leader? Because then that's just a year of your life being miserable to learn lessons that, frankly, we should have learned in grade school. So, Jeff, how do you take care of yourself? How do you make sure you're taking yourself as far as wellness, that kind of stuff? Um, playing, you know, <laughs> like making sure that I have time to play, like getting, allowing myself to get bored. Like one of the, like one of the strategies that I do to play is like really a lot, like in order to play, you actually have to calm yourself. You have to soothe yourself. Um, like, so what soothes me? Okay. You know, when I go for a walk, 
Oh, when I'm like going to play soccer. Oh, when I'm, you know, like dancing in my house, you know, when I'm making TikTok videos, when I start my day with play, like I prime my day by starting off by making a TikTok video or doing something creative. And then that sets the tone for my day. Right. And then I'm able to get through the day because I'm, I see everything as play. Like this right now is play to me. That's why I enjoy it so much. The talk I'm going to do in an hour or so is play. Like, it's just fun. Um, and that, like, that motivates me. And then also, and I talk a lot about this and from a positive psychology standpoint, you know, when I feel sad, I feel sad. You know, when I feel angry, I feel angry. Like, I allow myself to feel all the feelings. I don't embrace toxic positivity and, like, just all happy all the time, Right. You know, and when I when I feel sad, then, you know, I, I reach out for help. I think a lot of times we um, think we have to always be Instagram happy and that like that's just not realistic. And I talk about how there's like a beauty in sadness. Um, you know, my father passed away a few years ago and his brother showed up and this was the first time their brothers had showed up in like 20 years since like their mom passed away. So I felt sad and I felt grief for my dad, but I also felt joy and gratitude for them to be there. There's a beauty in feeling both those feelings and you should allow yourself to feel both those feelings at the same time. That's what living is. And I think we need to give ourselves more grace to feel all the feelings instead of constantly shooting on ourselves and telling ourselves that we should feel this way instead of just giving ourselves permission to feel whatever we want to feel. Jeff. Yeah. Is there anything I should have asked you that I haven't yet or anything else you want to talk about? Um, no, nah, man, I feel like we covered a lot. Um, I think one thing that I, uh, I'll end on because I think this is actually really important is um, there's something that a lot of people know as the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you know? And... Um, it's the way in which we understand the world, right? And we, the way in which we like navigate the world, like, okay, I need, I need to first cover my physiological needs, then I need to be safe. And then after I need to be safe, then I can start developing. And then eventually I get to self-actualization, right? And it's this whole idea of like, how do I show up in the world? But, but I think a lot of people don't realize that like the Maslow hierarchy of needs is like incomplete. Um, Abraham Maslow actually spent time with, um, the Blackfoot uh, nation, um, I think it was the Sik Sik tribe, and actually borrowed that concept from them. But then he kind of misinterpreted the concept because the, the, he has the Maslow hierarchy needs as a triangle, but it's not a triangle. It's actually a teepee. It's actually, and it, you know, and it's concentric in many ways. And what's at the bottom of the Blackfoot nation's hierarchy of needs is self-actualization. That's the bottom, that's the bare minimum. The bare minimum is figuring out how do I want to show up to the world, right? But then right after self-actualization is something known as community actualization, which is how are we as a community looking out for another, for one another? Like there wasn't, and you know, especially a long time ago in Native American population, they didn't understand poverty because like you were never impoverished because, because the tribe would always look out for one another, right? Like poverty would just be, fat, you know, you being disconnected from family, but everyone would get out, get, you know, look out for each other. So if someone was really struggling, you know, and going through depression, the whole tribe would figure out, okay, how do we address this, right? What's this person doing? Oh, okay. You know, you know, if we're going to use an example of like someone in a village, like, oh, this person's going through depression. In Western civilization, we would be like, give them medicine, give them, to, you know, and, and put them on their way. Maybe they'll go do some therapy. But what a village would do would be like, okay, well, why is this person depressed? Oh, it's because they can't provide for their family. Why not? Oh, because they're like plow broke. All right, let's fundraise so we can get them a new plow. Oh, we also need someone to you know, watch their kids. So the village actually watches out for one another. That's community actualization. We have forgotten that as a society, especially in the Western world. And then finally, at the very top is cultural perpetuity. And what's really cool about this is by yourself, you're insignificant. Your life, you're going to live 80 to 100 years if you're lucky. 
probably going to get forgotten. But if you look at it from cultural perpetuity, that actually means breath of life. That means you are the connection between your ancestors and your descendants. You are the crucial link between them. So all of their successes, their failures, the historical traumas, all of that, you get to pick what you want from history from seven generations ago and all the way back. And you get to decide what you get to pass on to the next generation. Like that is so impactful. That is so important. And that's so much about, again, it's not about you. It's about something so much bigger than you. And when you're that connection, then you're able to do work from a different standpoint. Then you're able to show up to work and be like, I'm not just making money here. I'm actually have a ripple effect that will have consequences and impact for generations. So how do I actually want to show up at work right now? Jeff, did you have like a resource or discount or gift you want to give to the listeners? Some people do, some people don't. Um, no, I mean, simply like, if they want to get in touch with me, they simply can go to uh, Jeff Harry Plays. Um, uh, that's my, actually, that's my handle. If you want to see my videos at Jeff Harry Plays, J-E-F-F. H-A-R-R-Y-P-L-A-Y-S. Um, my handle is that on TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Medium, all of that. Um, and then if you just actually want to have a conversation with me, um, I do do like a complimentary conversation where I talk about like how we can solve your issues in the workplace using positive psychology and play or just within yourself. And that you simply just go to rediscoveryourplay.com and simply click on the let's play button and you can set up a time where we can actually talk and connect. Hey, Jeff, who's your target demographic? Are you on like over, with companies like 10,000 more employees, small companies or? Uh, I, um, all kinds. I've worked with small businesses. I've worked with Fortune 500 companies. I work right now with a lot of tech companies. And right now, like this, I guess this month, I've been working with colleges. So it's kind of, a you know, across the spectrum. I also work with like Sherm chapters. So Anyone that that wants to improve how we work so that more people can enjoy work, that's who I want to work for. And so listen, we'll have the links to our social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.kevinshblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your network and your friends. And be sure to uh, subscribe, rate, and review the Jason Cabinet Experience. So Jeff, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any last minute wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Yeah, the last minute wisdom I would give to people, and they might have already realized this during the pandemic, is like, no one knows what they're doing. Nobody knows. I wish I knew we're that like just, 20 or 30 years ago. We're all just making it up as we go along. And you think that, you know, anyone that you think does know what they're doing, if you saw the behind the scenes, you'd realize they're as much of a mess as you are. And I think the more we tell ourselves that, the more we can empower ourselves to be like, being that no one knows what they're doing, I'm the expert of myself. So I am going to figure out what I want to do. And I'm going to follow my convictions. Jeff, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man, this was fun. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.